Hello and good evening. Welcome everyone to our Thursday live stream. And uh, here we are on a on a very uh, very interesting week of weeks. We've got Anthony, Damian, Frank, Kieran, Michael, Philip, Ruin Smith, Stephen Palmer, and of course William Bradness, Brandis, Night of Last Call, and Mod, and of course Wheel of Pain Extraordinaire. We starting off strong with the super chat from Mr. Damian Williams himself. Why you kill all your players, bro? Spoiler alert is in the title. I put it in the thumbnail. So if you're here, uh, we got some spoilers to talk about. Thank you, Damian. Damian, of course, a uh, longtime sub supporter of the Knights. Uh, Damian Williams, Atomic Hobo, our two largest uh, pro Knight supporters over the last five live streams. Not to be outdone by Team Evil, also known as the Dark Council of Heroes. Um, all right. Is the face cam not centered anymore? Is it too much to the left? I promise you it's it's exactly exactly the same. <laughs> oh boy. Uh hey, how how is everybody? I got a bunch of people active in the chat. That's great to see. Great to see everyone. Um you know, it's been uh well, it's been an interesting week. So we'll, we'll definitely get into that. Of course, we'll answer anything. Um that uh, we get them across. If you are interested in uh, sending me a message that I'm sure to get, if you have any questions, uh, put a big in capital letters with like an exclamation point, question, colon, and then ask your question. Um, if uh, if you do want to support the chat, uh, if you do want to support the channel, if you do want to support the uh, Knights of Last Call Memorial Fund, uh, please go. <laughs> feel free to leave us a super chat or use stream elements. Uh, you can do that by typing exclamation point tip That'll bring up our stream elements tipping page. There's also a link down below. And uh, so a couple of extra steps, but um, we do get a, a slightly higher percentage of that. So if you want to take the extra steps, please feel free to do that. But they're both appreciated and whichever you feel like doing is fine with me. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, well, before I, I start, so, you know, for starters, hi, everybody. Um, we uh, let's start off by just for people who are uninitiated. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about what happened. Uh, uh, Lockfin asked, uh, "R.I.P. Knights. Maybe I can get to the next campaign in a way I never did with the Rise of the Rune Lords campaign." What happened is the question. Um, TPK. That's what happened. Um, and and we can. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through this from my perspective uh, as both a game master. Uh, as both a game master of role playing games, as both a game master of my particular version of a role-playing game, which is to say a house rule Pathfinder 2 game. And then also as the owner operator uh, and MC of uh, a YouTube channel that is designed to educate, entertain, and enthrall. Let's let's start with where we were. So the Knights of Last Call um, going into this adventure were level 10. And they were, for all intents and purposes, a under-equipped, under-prepared, under-experienced party. Now, what do I mean by under-experienced? Well, you know, for, for Bob and for Nick, um, these were, this was their, literally their first time playing role-playing games. And uh, <laughs> Com Combat Medic Bush with a $25 tip. Thank you, CMB. Uh, CMB, of course, is a, is a great friend of the show and uh, a very, very, very uh, awesome, awesome hero in our dad in our patreon and uh thank you very much for that tip combat medic which i call him cmb i don't know why it's a combat maneuver bonus from pathfinder one i don't know it just sticks out to me thank you so very much uh that that is very nice and very awesome of you um so thank you cmb um so so let's start with where we were on that so for starters we have so we had two players brand new to role-playing games in general um we have three players uh matt nick and Bob, who've never played Pathfinder 2 before. Obviously, the first two haven't because they really haven't played any RPGs. Um, and then Tim, uh, also not uh, not, uh, not not that experience with Pathfinder 2. And uh, Nick and Tim made their characters late. So, um, you know, you, you, you don't get necessarily the, the full benefits of, you know, when you play a character from level one, you really get to experience and you get to see um, what they, you know, what they are all capable of doing. Now, when we moved into the Rise of the Rune Lords campaign, I made a couple of decisions. I, I was familiar with the Pathfinder 2 game system. 
Um, obviously, at that time, we had no YouTube subscribers, no Patreon. Um, <laughs> Jason B, tip $10. Lol, nice. Thank you, Jason B. Appreciate it. Um, and I made a couple of I made a couple of decisions. And, and, and again, I made these. These were always very open and very honest. So the first was I was, even back then, this is almost a year and a half ago, I was fairly unsatisfied with the Hero Point mechanic in Pathfinder 2 for two reasons. One, I had seen what um, after market rerolls can do, and that is sometimes they can come up short. They're called hero points. It sets a certain amount of expectation. But the most important thing is I knew that this was a young and inexperienced group. I knew already that Pathfinder 2 was a very uh, brutal game. And I had just gotten done playing for many, many, many years a ton of role-playing games that just gave players uh, a ton of narrative control over the game. And by that, I mean games like Blades in the Dark or Fate or Mutants and Masterminds or any of these other million other games where the players really actually do have a lot of control. I have grown as a GM to really trust and enable my heroes. And I really wanted to create a sense of heroic adventure in this campaign. Um, and so I created my own version of hero points, wherein players could spend a hero point and upgrade a success from a uh, failure to a success, uh, from a success to a critical success. And they could also do the same thing to their enemies. Now, I say this, at the time I had played Pathfinder 2, uh, we had done a couple campaigns, we had run through Plague Stone, so I was fairly familiar with the game levels 1 through 5, and I was familiar with it in a theoretical concept beyond that. But... Um, not as much beyond level five. Okay. Well, I also, um, where I, I also had, uh, implemented a stamina rule because I wanted to get rid of the funky, weird 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 minute rest periods that Pathfinder two seemed to suggest that you needed after each fight in order to allow players to a chance to recover focus points, but most importantly, recover hit points. Lastly, I also knew that nobody in my group was a healer. Um, they had a primal sorcerer, uh, uh, Burl, who did not take the heal spell. And uh, in fact, and until Escanor joined the party very late in the campaign as a paladin, a uh, champion rather, they didn't even have access to focal point healing. So the party essentially had no access to any sort of healing point or healing actions. So I introduced stamina as a nod to, uh, and I used the GMG variant of stamina, but I used it as relates to um, kind of, I kind of modified it to be more like a fourth edition healing surge. And if you're not played fourth edition, a uh, healing surge was a limited resource, kind of like hit dice from fifth edition, uh, but it would recover a good chunk of hit points. In fourth edition, it was 25%. Well, in our world, it was 100% of your stamina, which is 50, roughly 50% of your normal max hit points. But more importantly, I let the players automatically for free without having to take a feat or anything, gain the ability to spend these in combat. Now, they only got half as much when they spent it in combat to sort of incentivize them to play better inside of combat. And if they could make it all the way through to the end of combat, then they could spend one resolve point and essentially reheal all their uh, stamina to full uh, after the fight. And this meant that from like an action pacing perspective, I could just really push, you know, really push the uh, the player's envelope. I didn't have to figure out from a pacing perspective, what are they doing when they're sitting around for, you know, five to 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 50 to, to uh, minutes to an hour. Well, all that was great um, until we got to about fifth or sixth level. So what happened at fifth or sixth level was the players, um, now I should also know, sorry, last thing. Because of this, I did not award hero points the way that the GMG or the core rule book in Pathfinder 2 suggests that you should award hero points, right? Which is something like three to four to five per session. Um, I awarded them at a much slower rate. I usually only awarded them when the players accomplished a really big heroic milestone or when the characters really heavily displayed some awesome activity or awesome role playing. And to be completely honest, uh, that didn't happen that often. It happened a few times during the course of the campaign, but most of the hero points came from when the heroes, uh, you know, sort of accomplished a really big milestone within an adventure, um, saving an important or critical NPC, completing an important or critical task, or, you know, usually defeating the final boss of the adventure. Um, so this worked fine, but then around fifth or sixth level, the 
game changed in a way that I sort of didn't expect or anticipate, which was that people got things like their critical specialization abilities, which meant that they had now additional benefits on a crit. And you gained access to certain spells like slow or phantasmal killer or spells that really had a very powerful negative effect on a critical failure. Um, and this enabled my characters to spend a hero point to upgrade a success to a critical success or downgrade a enemy's failure to a critical failure. And it became very important to me that, apparent to me, I should say, that these hero points were problematic. Now, they were very powerful. And to be honest with you, I think in a normal game, I think they would have been out of the park broken. Luckily, um, again, going back to the beginning, this is not a group of seasoned diehard vets. Um, you know, these were mostly just a group of guys who wanted to get around and have a few drinks and, you know, kind of lollygag their way through the adventure. And the hero point, uh, the super strong hero points really supported them through this. And this, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, really came to a head, I think, in the end of the, the Vanisha adventure where, you um, you know, I really thought the party was going to TPK, but, uh, you know, Bob was able to spend four hero points, I think, in like two rounds or something like that. And he like crit twice and hit twice. Um, so that was kind of where we were. Now, our APs were never popular. They never made us much money. And, um, you know, we we started filming them less and less and less. Um, scheduling became a problem. And uh, eventually we decided, you know what, let's uh, let's try to do it online. Let's try to do it live. It'll be easier, quicker to edit. And, um, you know, we, we knew that we were going to have some people in the chat who were going to want to, you know, tip uh, and uh, wanted to, uh, you know, help the group out. And so we introduced a mechanic in our first session where the audience could tip their favorite hero uh, and grant them a hero point. Well, we did like a thousand dollars in like the first stream and the heroes had like eight or nine hero points. It, um I mean, Pathfinder literally doesn't even let you have more than three. And uh, it, it was immediately apparent that the, the balance had shifted far too much in the other side. Um, also, too, to be completely honest with you, this is something that we've talked about on the stream as well. Um, I think it's really, really hard to die in Pathfinder 2. I think if you, uh, you know, I understand that, um, you know, people do, uh, you know, um, these encounters or whatever, and that people do TPK. And, and I, I definitely could see that happening. Um, but um, if you play by the game's rules and you, you follow mostly moderate encounters, the occasional severe encounter, and your players are pretty competent and sort of know what they're doing, I really don't see a situation in which you're really going to die that often. And, you know, there, and I think that was part of the design goal. I don't think this is a mistake. I think Paizo did this um, um, very specifically. Um, now, that being said, that's moderate and that's severe. That same math that makes it very, 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 very unlikely that you will ever die in a moderate encounter and very, very, very unlikely that you'll ever die in a severe encounter means that by the time you get to an extreme encounter, uh, the math is now really working against you. And I really do think that a properly played extreme encounter is uh, a coin flip in terms of multiple party deaths or at the very uh, possibly a TPK. Um, and so it, it was pretty much a given that with all these hero points, um, we weren't, <laughs> we weren't going to be able to keep doing that. Um, and so this idea came in is let's introduce a wheel of pain and the wheel of pain was designed as sort of a random fun lark. Um, and you know, we were gonna, you know, sort of see that, uh, see what would happen. And uh, we wanted to include YouTube polls because we had access to this. All the things that we wish we had had when we were filming in the studio, which was the ability to sort of interact with our live studio audience, um, and, uh, you know, uh, could never do. So we introduced the Wheel of Pain, and, you know, things went back and forth. Some things were a little bit, you know, underpowered. Some things were a little bit crazy. Um, and, you know, we, we left it really to the chat uh, to sort of decide how certain things were going to go. And after our first instance with the Wheel of Pain, there was a lot of thoughts of, hey, you know, I, when I vote when I vote to give someone a hero point, uh, they get a hero point and they can spend it how they want. When I vote to give someone a, uh, when I vote to spin the wheel of pain, um, you know, if you make it a chat poll and then everybody votes, nothing happens. Uh, then it's like it's like I didn't get anything. Imagine if you could make a chat poll. Should I spend twenty dollars? Should Gwildor get a 
uh, to hear a point, and then the chat votes no, and then he just doesn't. Um, hey, I got a tip here from, uh, I don't know, let me see who this name is. Uh, my Squinge Arm, that's kind of an interesting name. Uh, he says, I'm too broke to Patreon, but I had this on a gift card. Thanks for all you do, and I really want you to succeed. Any tips or strategies for a hex crawl campaign? Great bundles on Drive uh, RPG right now, folks. Uh, yeah, it's a GM Day celebration on uh, Drive RPG still. So uh, we will get to that, my squinge arm. I just want to finish this this little bit up here, and we'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, but I will definitely get back to that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so uh, Wheel of Pain was, I think, very fun. Um, I think it was uh, entertaining. It was interesting. It introduced a certain element of randomness that I feel like is missing from Pathfinder 2 um, because Pathfinder 2 is not a game that easily, uh, by the in the game of Pathfinder 2, you will not find uh, rules or stuff for things like random encounters or, um, you know, things like that because um, the game, it, it struggles a little bit for... For dealing with that, um, because if the party encounters uh, a, a difficult fight or, or even a moderate fight after a fight and haven't had a chance to recover their hit points, then that fight could itself be uh, completely uh, that could itself could be a TPK. So the game, it, the game kind of struggles for, for a certain element of randomness. And as I said before, I feel like it's very difficult to kill each uh, party members or, or really threaten them in any conceivable way. So we upped the, the difficulty on the Wheel of Pain. And then we get to this Tuesday, and we're playing. Uh, the group is fighting a, a fight, uh, and then uh, some folks uh, spend some money on the Wheel of Pain, and uh, another 80 XP or, or two more ogres join the fight about halfway through the fight. Um, and I thought it made the fight very interesting and dynamic, and essentially it was just a, um, it was like a random encounter occurring uh, during the middle of a long fight. And going into this fight, uh, Tim's character, Gwildor, was already doomed to because he had uh, the prior session sacrificed a good chunk of his soul energy in order to release the energy of the Storville Deep Dam. Um, he managed to recover one of it, but that soul drain had left him at doomed two. And during the course of this fight, he uh, he got dropped. He uh, got charged by one of the ogres. They reduced him to zero hit points. Um, he got brought back up with a lay on hands or a heal spell from Escanor, but now he was basically uh, wounded one and doomed two. So at this point, he's basically as close to death's door as you can get. Um, and then as the fight wound down, we had another wheel of pain spin and it generated sort of an environmental effect, which I ruled was an avalanche. I placed it on the map. We rolled a die to determine how far the avalanche spread. It spread right up to Tim's character. Tim's character made a save. And remember he has hero points. He can upgrade a success to a failure. Um, but he rolled a nat one. So he rolled a critical failure. And that being the case, uh, even upgrading it to a failure would mean that the damage would still put him unconscious, which would mean um, that he was dead. So at that point, uh, Tim was dead. So now we had an interesting dilemma. <clears throat> and this is what I think I really want to get into. Um, and that, you know, uh, so at that point in that fight, um, you had a character that was dead. Now, was that because, was that character dead because of the Wheel of Pain? Logistically speaking, uh, yes. Um, now, at that point, the we kind of took a break, um, and we had a kind of a real problem, which was that, you know, this was the end of the adventure, and I had designed these adventures to be very uh, difficult. It's the end of the campaign, the gloves were off, you know, and some of the earlier adventures, you know, I had uh, not really pushed the envelope too much on a lot of these encounters. Most of the encounters, the Knights of Last Call fought were moderate, um, and maybe a few of the boss fights were severe. Uh, but here for the first time was a bunch of severe fights, and the final fight was actually extreme because in a prior episode, uh, when we were still recording, uh, the group had fled, had failed to kill uh, two NPCs and had to flee. And so those NPCs were now here. And also an, another, another important NPC had joined the final fight. So that final fight was an extreme. Uh, but, the, uh, but, the, but, the, but the example fight of the Forge was a 120 XP fight for a group of level, four, uh, level 10 four PCs. Well, Tim was dead. And that meant that the party only had three PCs. Now, I'll spare you the boring parts of the math, but that means that that 
fight was, according to Pathfinder 2, now an extreme fight. And we kind of discussed it quickly before we went back on air, but um, uh, basically the Knights had three options. They could continue to try to take out the, uh, the fortress of the giants and, you know, kill the big, bad, evil guy. They could flee back to town and, you know, suffer all of the sort of narrative consequences that might go along with that. Um, as sort of a random Wheel of Destiny event, we had originally ruled that Gwildor's body had been lost in the snow avalanche, but uh, uh, they <laughs> rolled on a random Wheel of Destiny thing and they found a body. Lucky found the body in the snow. So, uh, you know, there, it could be argued that they uh, had access. They did have access to Gwildor's body, uh, but they could have fled. And I mean, I wasn't too specific about it, but, you know, again, I am. I think failures and consequences should matter. And so it was very clear to me. I was like, look, if you guys retreat, um, you know, the giants are going to that's a that's a loss. You know, that's like the end of Empire Strikes Back. Right. The bad guys are going to use their this is a W for the bad guys. They are going to uh, they're going to be narrative consequences for this action. Um, and so the third action or third option, which was sort of an in-between option, was, OK, well, can we OK, we know that they are using this giant fortress as a means to forge weapons, that they have the Krieg clan ogres forging army uh, weapons and armor for the giant army that is coming down to try to destroy uh, all the lowlands of Varicia. Can we maybe, you know, Bob's like, uh, Bob Azius is an alchemist with the demolition charge feeds. Like, can we maybe sneak in and sabotage this whole operation and then get out? Okay. I mean, that's, uh, that's it's not, it's not full victory. It's not fleeing either. Um, and so the group decided to press on and they used in, they used stealth and uh, experts and they managed to find the room that had the forages and uh, demolition charges takes like one minute to set. Um, you know, you were probably getting, Bob was going to have to set at least one or two of those. Uh, but the room was full of ogres and it was most importantly full of two ogres who had previously uh, kicked the group's butt a bunch of adventures ago. And so I think there was a, a sense for uh, revenge. And I also think there was a sense of like, come on, you know, we, we need to do this. But mathematically, um, they were dead at that point. Um, I mean, theoretically, the chat could have maybe spent like $100 or $200 on hero points. And the group could have used five or six hero points in order to turn that into a victory. Um, but uh, the sorcerer Salone was going to kill everybody simply because she had access to the fly spell. And N N Escanor the Paladin and Aesius the Barbarian do not have even have a ranged weapon. And the only person who could have hit them at that point would have been Burl. And I believe uh, Burl at that point was, I think, pretty much out of all of his fifth and fourth level spells. Um, and so really only had a, a handful of spells. I um, uh, got a question here. Did you adjust the combat balance after adding the Wheel of Pain or did you stick uh, to your pre-Wheel of Pain uh, plan? Um, no, yeah, the... It, the, the, the difficulty was set as the difficulty was set, as it had been set, which is mostly moderates uh, leaning towards severe as you get to the end of an adventure or to an important battle. Um, and this fight or this campaign, uh, sorry, this adventure was going to have the first extreme fight of the entire campaign, uh, which is, which would have been the fight with Barl. Um, <laughs> Matt, I, I know you've been chatting. I just saw this, though. I have a sling. Um Yes, you had a sling. Um, and and so, uh, you know, uh, let's say, you know, in that moment that uh, all hero points, uh, you know, from the chat were deleted, uh, all Wheel of Pain spins were deleted. I really don't think the group, we'll never know, of course, but I really don't think the group was ever going to succeed at that. Um, uh, the Sorceress alone was going to kill everybody. Um, and, you know, uh, and also the hags, due to their clairvoyance spells and their divination spells, which they get as part of their coven abilities, uh, you know, had been essentially tracking and whispering and telepathically talking to the players uh, the entire time. Um, I mean, they knew where they were, right? It's just kind of one of those hand wavy D and D type things where you go, well, uh, they're down the hall. I mean, I mean, theoretically, probably every monster in the entire dungeon level should just rush them, but we don't do that because that would be pretty lame. And I mean, that's been the case since like, you know, the beginning of time. Um, but yeah, so, you know, what you had there was two party members, um, you know, really not capable of dealing with sort of a, you know, they could deal with Hookmaw, right? So the same thing they've been fighting the whole 
damn campaign, right? Another big, dumb, brutish creature in melee. Great. You know, they're totally prepared to fight that. But something that can fly or turn invisible um, with mere image spells and access to magic missiles and lightning bolts. Um, I just don't, I just don't think they were ever going to beat that. Um, and with uh, Gwildor dead and Burl out of spells, they just didn't have any sort of firepower. And then even if they did, uh, again, that was mathematically a 120 XP fight, but for three characters, that is a, uh, extreme encounter, which means as written, it's a, it's a coin flip, you know, it's a, it's a coin flip. So, it, it, it's a pretty situation, a uh, pretty rough situation in memoriam from uh, Lazarus. Thank you. Thank you, Lazarus Dark. Um, it was going to be a pretty brutal situation regardless. Now, we'll never know because once the party committed to that fight, once the die was cast, once they crossed uh, the Rubicon, um, you know, uh, the Wheel of Pain uh, got got lit up. And it generated a bunch of different spins, any one of which I think would have basically um, been enough to, again, I always already felt like the fight was a foregone conclusion. And in my mind, I thought, okay, you know, Gwildor is dead uh, and, and the group is going to, you know, slink away. And if they can figure out a way to not get into a fight, if they could figure out a way to not get into a fight, you know, maybe they can use their stealth and they can accomplish something inside of this. But as soon as um, they decided to sort of ambush this this den of ogres, um, I I was like, okay, this is uh, this is not gonna this is not gonna end well. Uh, but once the wheel of pain spins started happening, um, you know, the the chance essentially went to closer and closer to zero. And then, obviously, I mean, just icing on the cake. But the final spin was the infamous last call. Which was like the 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 high, one one out of fifty chance uh, that you get this, and of, it, it just summons a, a basically a, a complete other extreme encounter, and it just uh, it killed the group. Excuse me, uh, it was a wipe. The, the, I actually had the hags join the fight. Um, I actually didn't really do. They actually killed one of the other ogres. That's all really they ended up doing. Um, so uh, I do feel like um, at that. I mean, obviously at that point it was it was a foregone conclusion. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's that's where we le that's where we ended it. So, what did we learn from this? Well, we learned a couple of important things. One, the wheel of pain, uh, the tipping structure, made us a shitload of money, like a shitload of money. Um, it made us more money in those five live streams than basically. If you ignore like the last month or so of the Patreon, it made us more money than the entire first year times of, of our this channel's existence times like 10. So, okay, that's number one. Number two, um, combats, when we had two combats in a session, we made more money than when we had one combat in a session. We got a lot of cool, uh, we got a lot of cool comments, a lot of cool feedback from folks um, about how they thought that the episode where the group was climbing up the mountain was really cool um, and it was really awesome. And, uh, you know, uh, they liked the clocks. And then there was the episode where they had to sort of, uh, they beat the, the Skull Ripper and then they had to free them the, the dam and they were exploring the arcane situations. Um, those only had one fight apiece, didn't make as much money. Now, uh, you know, you know, I should also note, uh, you know, Anthony said the, the wheel of pain money was insane. It was, and certainly it was in that last session. But I should note that um, the first session we uh, we had over, I mean, the last 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 Tuesday, um, we had about 500 bucks. Um, the first session we did a thousand dollars and I close to 800 of that went to the heroes um, overall more money overall the five sessions that we played um I, I did the math today uh overall more money went to the heroes than went to the uh to me to the wheel of pain to the gm now there are four heroes and there are one thing now also remember sometimes the wheel of pain was a miss you know aoe frightened one is it's not nothing it's an important deal um, you know, in that last fight, uh, we got Potion of Elixir again, but the only person who was hurt was a random ogre minion, but that was the Wheel of Pain spin. It was random, and they, 
they got the uh, they got a random level six minion who went from 50 to 100. But it was random and it was chaotic and it was crazy. And in many ways, it rep it kind of yeah, now obviously it was turned to 11, right? It was like turned to 11. But in many cases, um, it reminded me of when I used to play older uh, D and D adventures from like third edition. Um, and certainly before that, um, when you would have, you know, a random encounter chart for a dungeon level and way down at the bottom, there would be like that, there would be like that one in 100 chance, uh, that the party would encounter something absolutely undefeatable, right? Absolutely devastating. And it, and it kind of, you know, kind of scared the piss out of you a little bit. It, it, it was this kind of scary thing to know that there was this random chance that you didn't necessarily have complete control over everything. And so um, I, I liked that it brought that element into the game. I liked that as a GM, I didn't know what was going to happen. Now, all that being said, uh, when we impl implemented all this, I thought we were going to make like 100 bucks. Um, our APs never got any views. And I never even in a million years had thought um, that that many people would tip for, for hero points or for Wheel of Pain. Um, so, you know, I think in either of those situations, hero points or Wheel of Pain spins, it, 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 uh, it undermined the, uh, the, the, the nature of the game. It made it fun. It made it entertaining. It made it crazy. But it was not exactly Pathfinder 2 or role-playing game at that point. It was a little bit more Wheel of Fortune. Um, because, again, I, I cannot stress enough that, uh, you know, the hero points, uh, you know, they were very powerful. Um, and as a GM who's been handing them out this entire campaign, I would say that uh, while I do think that they worked at lower level and I do think that the rules as written, Pathfinder 2 hero points are garbage, uh, I do I won't be using my style of hero points again. <laughs> um, they once you get to a certain point where the the party's um, you know has crit specialization and those really really powerful spells, um, you know, also too like uh, especially against v v foes that you know there's only like one of them, so like your typical one versus four boss situation. Um, if the boss throws out a spell and that's their basically their action for the whole turn and every character just spends a hero point to just negate the boss's turn. Um, it basically like you stun three the boss. Um, and it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much a, a no, a, a, a no, a no win situation at that point. So yeah, they were, they were both very, very, very powerful. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an experiment. It was to see what, what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. Now, all that being said, um, you know, I have uh, TPK'd a lot. I don't want to say I have TPK'd, uh, but you know, uh, I have presided over uh, TPK many times in my gaming career. Sometimes it was due to, uh, you know, stupid. I mean, a lot of people are like, I love it when, you know, the fight stretches to the last minute and it's like, you know, a crippling, you know, like a bitter fight to the end. And I've had some of those. There was an infamous fight versus a goth which is like a lesser beholder kin. And it was like six party members and they had one higher level party member. And, you know, they it was this epic fight that they thought was they were going to have the advantage of because they had this higher level wizard with them who was played by a fellow PC. But he got like stun locked the entire the entire fight basically they got picked off one by one and only one character survived and as she ran out from the dungeon i rolled random encounters and i think i rolled like uh maybe two allops or two wraiths some sort of incorporeal undead and they basically like tracked her down and, and brutally like you know clawed her down from the back um as they sort of stalked her through the darkened halls of the dungeon as she fled alone as the rest of her party members were dead so that was a tpk that you know kind of represented uh, sort of a uh, uh a, a brutal burnout um but i've also had tpks that were just like instantaneous you know like it was just like oh everybody did that okay well you're all dead i mean i don't know what to tell you um i've had random encounters that basically have wiped the party uh on a go um, I one time ran, rolled, randomly rolled a, a red a adult red dragon for a fairly low level party, and it's it swooped down and it, it breathed on him and it killed him. And then the people it didn't kill it tortured to death. So like a cat playing with his food. Um, now why do I do those things? Well, because 
you know, it's like last night in, in the Patreon, you know, people were asking me like, why don't I play video games? And I said, well, I don't, I don't play any video games with plot. And I was like, let me, let me explain it to you. Like my favorite games are things like uh, SimCity or like a total war game. Um, the story that I want to experience is sort of the one that sort of just kind of emerges from random happenstance and events. Um, and, you know, Wheel of Pain and brought that in. Even the Wheel of Destiny brought that in. Now, obviously, that's, you know, it's fun once. You know, like, I like going to Vegas. I'm going to Vegas next week. Well, I don't want to go to Vegas every day. You know, I don't want to go to Vegas week after week after week, right? You can only lose all your money so many times. Um, and, um, you know, from a, from a business perspective, this was great. Um, if we had launched and just done what we've always been doing, um, I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if the group would have TPK'd, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, oh, we, I, I don't know. We would have made a fraction of as much money as we made. Uh, now, Grant, I never expected to make this money. So I am, I'm okay with going back to, you know, a bog standard, uh, you know, uh, process and, and, you know, greatly reducing the amount of money, uh, that we're making. You know, I'm looking at this now, uh, Vin, and I think maybe you're right. Maybe this is, maybe this is smaller. I don't know. Let me, let me see what's going on here. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's make this bigger. All right. Is this me? Yeah. Okay. Hey, look at that. I'm all up in your face now. Um, Vin is almost always right. That is actually correct. Correct. So now, wow, look at me. I'm huge. Um, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm clipping. Oh, Jesus. Okay, there we go. Um, oh my little my lights in the my lights in the shot a little bit. Look how unprofessional I am. Um. So yeah. So um. Okay. So yeah. So going back to it. Uh. So. So what does that really mean from, from a channel perspective? Well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, my goal was obviously to play Pathfinder 2, but from the beginning, we had these Derek Hero points. We had these stamina rules. We had these resolve rules. Uh, Bob lost clumsy when he became enlarged. I allowed spellcasters to spend resolve points to get back spell slots in the middle of an adventure. Uh, needless to say... Those are all extremely huge changes to the way that people play the game and the way that the outcome has. Do both of those, do all of those things greatly favor the heroes? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, now, because I don't fudge and I'm found on, on, on the table, I roll, my di I roll my dice out in front of the screen and on Foundry, I don't roll my dice privately. And that, this is like my way of being like, look, uh, we're playing D&D, &D, it's random, anything could happen. I can't fudge, so I need to come up with some way to allow the players uh, the ability to kind of fudge for themselves. And that's where the Derek Hero points came in. The idea was, I won't have to cheat. Uh, they can cheat, but it's all above board, right? It's all out there, and it's a resource that they can use in order to essentially uh, overcome what is otherwise the you know vagaries of fate and the problems that it generates, um, and so yeah, so I didn't expect everybody to, um, you know, I didn't expect for, I don't know, roughly two thousand dollars to be donated to the heroes. Uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon for some of our top donators to just make blanket donations and say, distribute it across the entire party. And uh, you know, we started one session, um, the session where they climbed up the mountain. Uh, it started off with you know two people gaining hero points like from the very first from the very first go there was like a hundred dollar donation twenty five for each players now um, so you know that's very strong the wheel of pain you know some of the rolls even stronger I mean I I knew that some of those wheel of pain rolls were going to be uh, un theoretically unbeatable unless the group was in a situation where they had like 
three or four or five hero points, right? Um, because otherwise, um, you know, it was just going to be too much of a uh, too much of a price to bear. But I think a combination of a lot of spins on the Wheel of Pain plus not a lot of hero points plus depleted resources uh, led to um, the first death and then proceeding onward in an even more depleted state with a party member down and then getting really Wheel of Pain. And again, uh, almost no hero points, uh, I think, were generated between those two events. In fact, I think the only hero points that got awarded was when Tim died, we allowed him to give his hero points to Lucky. Um, and uh, so as an experiment, I, I hesitate to call it a complete failure. Um, I hesitate to call it a complete failure because on one hand, uh, you know, we are in the process of forming an LLC. I have to file some forms with the government. I have some taxes to pay that from the income that we made last month. We are setting up a new Forge server for our Northern Reaches mega community game. Um, these all cost, this all costs money. And this channel, this live stream, this AP, uh, which prior to us going live had in the 27, 26 episodes prior to us going live had made uh, approximately $300 total lifetime. Um, and we did over $3,000 uh, or maybe like $2,500 um, in just these five sessions. So, um, or something close to it. So, you know, uh, you know, as a business, a, 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 it was as an entertainment venture, you know, uh, you know, was it a little bit more WWE than, uh, you know, Olympic wrestling? Yeah, it was, um, you know, the, the audience, the chat, the people tipping, uh, you know, they got to sort of pick the winners and it was kind of exciting and it was kind of fun and it kind of came to that conclusion right it could have also come to the other conclusion right where imagine if all that money had been hero points instead right and now <laughs> everybody had like 10 or 12 hero points right you'd go uh, okay well uh you know this this is the game is literally not even a challenge anymore you know you could you could spend a hero point to tie your on a skill check to tie your shoes um it just happened to go the one way instead of the other and we ended up with a tpk so Everybody's dead. And the other thing about me too is right, wrong, or indifferent, those were the precepts of the game. I mean, that is the the nature of the beast. And I don't like to walk back on things. Um, you know, this isn't one of those situations where, uh, you know, the situation where, uh, you know, I'm just going to roll that back and like pretend like it didn't happen. Uh, total entry. So what you're saying is the audience caused the TPK. I am saying that... Um, the situation that the players were in was pre pre very precarious, partially because of their the way that their characters were built and the way that their characters were under equipped, um, but also because of the wheel of pain, which had you know you know uh, sort of shattered them down. Um, at the same time, they also had access to spells and hero points that they would never have had access to. Uh, because of the money that had been donated to them for hero points. Um, and I think at the beginning of the one session, I think Burl and Gwildor each spent two or three hero points as resolve points so that they could get back like 20 levels of spell slots. Um, those are spell slots they should never even have had. Um, like, period. Um, and, and you saw this in the play, right? Like, how often did you see Gwildor or Burl cast a cantrip? Like, never. They never cast cantrips. Why? Because they always had their max level spells. They fired them off like they was going out of you know style. Because they knew that they could use their resolve points or they could use audience-bought hero points to restore those spell slots. So, I mean, it, it fundamentally shifted and changed the way that the game was being played. Um, now, that being said, after the Wheel of Pain and that fight uh, had caused Gwildor to die. And, uh, you know, I would, I mean, the Wheel of Pain was 100% responsible for the avalanche, which 100%, uh, you know, is going to, uh, you know, kill the, 100% uh, is going to kill the uh, Gwildor. Gwildor would not be dead if it wasn't for the Wheel of Pain. Um, at that point, the group, um, 
you know, again, made a decision to press on. We'll never know exactly what hap- will have, have, have happened, but my guess is I do think everybody would have died in that. Uh, at the very least, we would have had, uh, hey, we got a super chat. We got two super chats. Okay. Um, self-confessed to the guest. Would you recommend GMs be hands-on when new players are being suboptimal, e- I- e.g. not equipping themselves, or should the GM act as more of a mentor. You know, it's a tough situation. I see this all the time in fifth edition where people go, hey, my group doesn't have a healer. You know, what should I do? And you'll see people say, oh, well, you should make sure that, you know, every 20 feet in the dungeon, there's a drinking fountain that is a potion of healing or that all the monsters drop potions of healing or you come up with some way that everybody can heal. Um, You know, I, I do think that, you know, when players are playing not optimally, um, if you try to play Pathfinder 2 as written, you know, you're going to run into a lot of deaths for sure. So um, I I did, I certainly played this way with, you know, with the group early on. And I think even into the later levels, not as much because, you know, I was expecting some, uh, you know, at this point them for to pick it up. But like making suggestions like, hey, you know, you do have one action left. You could lay on hands or you do have one action left. You could you know, you could shield block, you could retributive strike with your reaction. You're within 15 feet. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not the adversary, uh, you know, of the group. Uh, ben and Donnie just sped up the process, to be honest. Well, again, we'll never know. Uh, do I think that the group was uh, dead when they walked in there? If not a single wheel of pain spin had been spent, uh, spin? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, but uh, once the wheel of pain started spinning, it was, it was a given. There was at that point whatever their percentage was, it was low. Uh, you know, maybe they had a twenty or thirty percent chance of survival, um, especially with Burl being like low on spells. Because um, you know, with the hero point rules, Burl being able to turn things into a critical hit meant that Burl was just capable of just this outrageous damage generation. And and you could see the difference when Burl had hero points. And we all know that spell attacks really suffer in Pathfinder 2 because um, because uh, spellcasters don't get uh, the same proficiency scaling as other characters, and they don't get the item bonus to their attack rolls. So, you know, Escanor and Aesius both had a plus two weapon, so they are attacking the monster's armor class with that plus two weapon, uh, whereas Burl and Gwildor, to a certain extent, don't have access to that plus two bonus. It's just the way that the game works. Um so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, a situation where when you have access to hero points, spell attacks become way more interesting because you can just, oh, I missed? Okay, well, it's a hit. Oh, I hit? Okay, it's a critical hit. Um, and so, you know, I think I think it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a, uh, a situation where hero points even shaped the way that the characters built uh, their characters. Um, and yeah, I, I did dissolve, it did devolve into rocket tag for sure at the end there, um, because whichever side was going to get more tips uh, was going to have such a uh, you know unbeatable um, and uh, un, un, unthinkable and unbeatable advantage. Um, so I'm sorry if I missed a bunch of questions here. I'm going to try to go back in here and see what we have here. But um, uh, Matt. Mr. Burl himself says he was low on spells because of all the previous wheel spins over the last three sessions. Um, yeah, no, that's true. You definitely had to spend a lot of spells uh, because of wheel spins. That is definitely true. Um, but you also got a lot of spells back uh, because of hero points. But you wouldn't have had to get those spells back if it wasn't for the wheel pain. So it's kind of a it's kind of a it's a chicken and the egg situation. I mean, I think um, I think. I think the real question is, and I think this is what Matt's argue, you know, point is, is was the Wheel of Pain more powerful than, um, you know, than than the hero points? Some elements of the Wheel of Pain, yeah, absolutely. Some uh, some of the spins on the Wheel of Pain were very powerful, and they're very, uh, you know, very very painful. Um, so from that end, you know, do you know at a certain point, um. You know, we had done like a thousand and then I thought, okay, well, that was crazy. Uh, And then the last two sessions, we only did a couple hundred dollars in tips. And so I thought, okay. And it was actually fairly balanced. Um, I think in session four, the one where they climbed up the mountain, um, we did about two hundred and five dollars in tips. And it was uh, 
$100 for the players and $100 for the GM. And realize that this wasn't apparent as well, that each time you buy any one player a hero point or a GM point, uh, the cost doubles. But uh, you could spend on each player. It's not like the players double. It's like, okay, you gave it to Burl. Burl's cost doubles. You give it to Asius. Asius's cost doubles. So, um, you know, spreading that out, uh, you know, a little bit, I, I feel like we were like, okay, well, this seems pretty balanced, right? Like the heroes are getting a bunch of hero points. And the wheel pain spins are creating some, you know, tough situations. And maybe I kind of hoped or felt that we had reached a sort of natural equilibrium point. And then it, we did not last session. Last session, like I said, it was, I might've been like $400 towards the wheel of pain and like only a hundred dollars towards the player. And so once it got out of balance like that, it just, it just fell apart, you know? And, uh, and, uh, and everybody died. Um, and, um, you know, that, that is a, uh, that's a rough spot to be. And it's a, certainly a, a, a situation where, uh, you know, at that point, uh, it, it needed to change. So everybody died and we get to do something new. I don't know what it's going to be yet. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm having lunch with Mr. Holloway tomorrow. Um, I'm hoping I can talk to Mr. Smith and Mr. Mr. Bob, uh, this weekend, uh, get a chance to Tim's sick. He, he caught whatever his daughter had. So I haven't really had a chance to really talk with him yet, but we're going to figure out what we want to do, what people want to see, what, you know, we, we have some polls up in our Patreon about what people want to see or do next. Um, you know, we've been a Pathfinder 2 focused channel. Um, and so I do feel like I want to uh, continue to support Pathfinder 2. Um, I still think it's an interesting game. I don't think it's a perfect game, uh, but I certainly feel like uh, it has uh, some strong elements that I really do enjoy and appreciate. Um, and what does that look like? I don't know. Uh, we could go a lot of different directions. So, uh, and then there's some polls up in the Patreon for people who are voting. Um, but, you know, again, I, I've, uh, I've overseen many TPKs. Uh, as far as they go, to me, that was one of the more entertaining ones. Most of them, most of them don't, don't end nearly as like, uh, you know, sort of like bittersweet, dramatic endings. Um, you know, I was really, uh, was really impressed with the way that, uh, you know, um, Tim, Tim had a great death soliloquy. Um, you know, Bob had a perfect, great, awesome, amazing, uh, sort of suicide send out as he threw his explosive laden bodies into the magma forge. Um, you know, I, to me, that was pretty awesome. Um, you know, I also understand that my perception of D and D my perception of role-playing games is much, much different than I guess maybe a lot of people in the audience or things of that nature. Uh, <laughs> Lockfin, that is also very case. Um, and um, it, they usually are not quite so lucrative. So, uh, you know, do I want to, um, Damien, with a super chat, I still say PF2 base with other games sprinkled in. Yeah, there's there's some desire to see some other games. Um, you know, one thing that I, I think we've talked about this here in the past is I'm not really beholden uh, to the YouTube crowd because the the patrons um, and the tips from you know streamers and tippers like you uh, really support this channel. We don't really make a lot of money from views or anything on YouTube. Uh, our videos tend to run really long, and um, you know nobody actually really watches them. So, except for Torn 180. Thanks, Torn 180. Um, yeah, we are definitely going to continue with Pathfinder 2 content. Um, it's going to be the majority. It was, it's not even going to be like 51%. It is definitely going to be, uh, you know, 60, 70% plus 80% Pathfinder 2 content. Um, we want to do more. You know, it's just finding the right time in the space. Um, but like I said, one of the things that we are very sensitive to is what do our patrons want to see? I mean, they pay the bills, they keep the lights on. Um, and they are, you know, the folks in, that come to our live streams and really support us. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we are giving our patrons, um, as well as our YouTube audience, but especially our patrons, uh, the kind of content and the kind of stuff that they want to see. Um, and it's really interesting because again, um, historically, um, you know, when, I'm trying to think when it was. There were several times in the course of the game's history where I thought about just ending the Rise of the Rune Lords AP completely uh, because 
we literally wouldn't even get a thousand views um, on a video. Um, you know, we would film, we would record. It would be, you know, we've got we've got four me plus four guys, um, three of whom have children, two of whom who live forty five minutes an hour away, um, and plus on top of everything else that's happening, in everybody's lives, and it's a pandemic. Um, you know, it, it became like it was really difficult to get everybody together. And we'd get together, you have to set up all the lights and we have to set up eight different cameras and we have to set up all the audio and all this other stuff. And then we would record for, you know, three, four, five, four hours, maybe get three hours of footage out of that, turn that into like a two hour, two and a half hour AP. That would take me, I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty reasonably proficient, but I'm the most proficient editor of all time. But that would take me at least as twice as long as the video was in order to edit it, right? Because I have to watch through the whole thing with every camera. I have to place them in the places. I have to cut out stuff. I have to add graphics. Um, and uh, uh, self-confessed cynic, first stream to do alongside your main PFE to <laughs> Monster Hearts. The patrons have voted. Oh, no. Um, uh, Lockfin, I'll answer that in a second. Um, but, you know, long story short, uh, me personally, I would have... 20 hours, let's say, um, into a AP episode. And each of my players would have at least, you know, three to four hours, um, you know, plus their drive time. So, you know, as a, as a group, you know, you have four people putting in four hours each, that's 16 hours. You have me putting in 20 hours myself. So that's like 36 hours, it's almost a full work week to produce one AP, which is fine, except no one was really watching it. And we had some, you know, loyal fans and we really appreciated those folks of course but from an economic standpoint we're like look uh, you know people want to see combat and tactics people want to see um you know night schools people want to see they, they're they interested in my uh right my reviews of classes and people are like oh give us a class breakdown like no nat did and you know i kind of avoided trying to do the top 10 lists and you know all the stuff that um you know a lot of channels like this do just because like yeah those have already been done you know how it's played covers all the rules and uh you know no nat does a lot of those top 10 lists and stuff um, so I was like, okay, well, we'll give them something different. And that, that content blew up. And at, at a certain point, I'm like, guys, it might just not even be worth it. It might be much better for us, for our audience, for the channel, for us just to get together and record some combat and tactics to talk about night school and, uh, or do something else or just talk about, you know, bullshit and, and do that. Uh, because, um, uh, it wasn't the AP wasn't making any money in it. And quite frankly, it took a lot of time from out of my schedule, out of my day. It was like a part time job to edit one of those videos. Um, and uh, I was like, OK, I, I, I don't think anyone would care if we stopped recording them. Uh, and so we almost did at several times. Um, and the only reason I was OK with like bringing it back, because I was like, well, if we're going to do it live, I'm just sitting at home. There's no extra work. I don't have to edit because it's just live. And so it was kind of like. Yeah, we'll add this wheel of pain and we'll let people tip for hero points. I don't care if we screw it up because this thing doesn't generate anything anyways. You know, it's like I, I didn't feel like we were really sacrificing anything here because nobody nobody really cared. Um, And, uh, you know, some people did appreciate that. But financially, it was a huge loser for us. Like if I, if this was being run, I'm a horrible business person. Um, I've, ha I've owned and operated like several businesses. They've all failed. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, one of the reasons is cause I, you know, I sunk cost policy and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, if I was being strictly business operated, I would have said, Hey, you know, I looked at YouTube and I would have been like, I need to do more videos like known at, or I need to do more videos like taking 20 or the dungeon coach or the dungeon dudes or whoever, or professor dungeon master, um, maybe even do some fifth edition stuff. Uh, because you know, I'm going to be spending the same amount of time producing and editing and creating content regardless. Why not get a bunch of views and get a bunch of subs and all this other stuff for it as well. So me sticking with the, uh, with the AP was mostly because, uh, you know, we started our channel that way and, uh, you know, getting together with the guys, uh, was, you know, fun. And then it became, a, it became a, a real challenge. It became a real chore, uh, just because of painful schedules and everything like that. So, um, you know, part of the blame should be on me, right? I mean, I created the tip 
donation system, right? I mean, uh, the wheel of pain, you, people spun it, but it was my call. Um, and I could have removed it at any time. And I chose not to. And part of the reason I chose not to is because I was like, well, look, we are finally getting some money. This AP is finally getting some viewers. It's getting, a, we got more views, not live. I'm talking about after the live stream ended and then people watched after the fact, right? Watching a live stream when it's not live. We got more views on our live stream videos of the AP after they had been live than we did with our non, with our edited APs. It didn't even, so even ignore every tip that anybody ever gave. On a video for video basis, we made more money with the live stream, crazy hero point, crazy wheel of pain videos. I don't, I don't know. People like to watch car wrecks. I, I mean, you know, that's, it's the internet, it's YouTube. That's, people like to see that. And, you know, that is what the wheel of pain uh, definitely turned the game into um so well squeezing arm that's very well said and i appreciate that um all right um so that is everything i had to say i'm sorry if i missed any questions i'm going to kind of scroll back quickly and if someone had put a big question i'm going to try to get to it um oh man russian bots are out I see people killing them though, so that's good. Um, and again, uh, you know, if you if you super chat me or tip me, I will try to get to you. But I'm just going to kind of go through here quickly. Uh, question: How was my day? Uh, that's okay. I actually didn't. Uh, I had a hard time getting work done today. Believe it or not, I was a little distracted. Uh, I was on Discord a lot, unfortunately today. Uh, you know, I did some work in the morning, but um, you know, it was a nice day, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, well. I had a lot of plans that I wanted to do for the channel, uh, but now I have to figure out what the hell we're doing with any of this. So it's going to be, uh, it kind of changed things up a bit, but I am excited to go to Vegas. Uh, my dad had a heart operation today. I know that sounds crazy that that should be like not a big thing, but you know, they like stick a thing through your leg and they go up your veins and they investigate your heart veins or whatever. But apparently he was fine and didn't need any sort of stint. So, uh, Good for him. So that was good to hear. Um, how dare I? Uh, that is correct. How did I feel during the last round of that TPK? All right. Let's be honest here. There is always a part of me that, um, that hates the thing that I have made, right? Um, as soon as I start, a campaign or as soon as I start a character part of me goes I'm already looking forward to the next one um there is uh I mean I'm about to be 40 years old I am single I have uh been in I don't know six or seven long-term relationships part of me feels constrained when I'm involved in something right I want I want to explore I want to dabble um, and so part of me uh, kind of felt like a certain degree of, okay, this is exciting. I didn't expect this to happen. The, the thing that I find the most boring as a game master is knowing what's going to happen. And, and that either, and, and you don't have to fudge to do that. But like if, if you have a fairly uh, linear group or you have a fairly linear adventure um, and you're playing a game that, um, you know, uh, is kind of balanced in the rules wise to be very advantageous to the players. It's the case that most nine, 99 times out of a hundred, you know, the heroes are going to win and then you are going to move on from there. Um, it could, as a GM, I can just sit there going like, I'm a little bored, you know? Um, and so I like having to be on my toes. I like having to think quickly and outside of the box. And I get a little excited sometimes when I feel like things are going to change up. Matthew Bruns asks, question, could you explain your rule on recovering spells with resolve points? I certainly can. We actually had two versions of this rule. As a reminder, resolve points, uh, you get uh, four of them. If you uh, if your highest stat is 18, so you have a plus four, you get four of them per day after a long rest, after you've completely recovered. I don't Paizo doesn't actually have a term for that. So uh, during your daily preparations, I guess would be the term, uh, you would get a number of resolve points equal to your highest stat bonus. So four, and then at level 10, you get five. Um, a... Spellcaster can spend in the beginning part of the game, 
I allowed the spellcaster to spend a resolve point outside of combat. So when they were not in initiative order, a spellcaster could spend a resolve point to gain their level in spell slots back. So this would mean that a level five character could spend a resolve point and regain five aggregate spell levels back. So they could regain a level three and a level two spell, or they could get back three level one spells and one level two spell. That would be five spell levels. Uh, that quickly, as the party got too high level, that became very, very powerful. So I did change it, I think sometime around the end of the Skinsaw Murderers, where I changed it to the party, uh, a, a PC can spend a resolve point to regain number of spell levels equal to their highest castable slot. So at level seven, they would get back four spell levels. At level nine, they would get back five spell levels. So this means the idea was number one, it would give my spell casters the ability to stay charged up and casting spells. I thought like that would be more fun for them. I felt like it would be more fun for the audience. Um, and I felt like it would give the, the, the game a little bit more of a heroic feel because the heroes wouldn't be as tempted to go, okay, we need to retreat back to town and we need to sleep for eight hours so I can get back my spells. I, again, I wanted to kind of keep that like, action hero movie die hard feel going and i didn't want the characters to always have to be camping for the night or going back to town so resolve was a way to let me keep the spell casters in it the second thing it did was my baseline presumption is that a character after a fight was going to take some damage and they would need to spend a resolve point at the end of that fight to get back all their stamina to be at full hit points to for the next encounter but if the group was able to play well, if they were able to use tactics and positioning so that, say, the casters weren't being attacked as much or not taking as much damage, at the end of a fight, the caster might be like, I didn't really take any damage. I'm not even down that many hit points. I don't need to spend a resolve point to recover my stamina. Instead, I can use that resolve point as sort of a reward for me playing safely as a caster and maybe as a reward for the melee characters or the martially based characters for sort of protecting me or defending me or doing a good job tying up the bad guy. Uh, I, I will use that resolve point instead to reward myself by getting back some of the spells that I just cast in that fight, letting them keep going. So that is how that worked. Um... How proud of you are of all that amazing role play, especially Tim and Bob during their death kill. Yeah, I talked about this a little bit, but I thought that was great. I mean, those guys really embraced what was happening um, and, you know, they went for it and they handled it like real professionals. Um, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, they saw the writing on the wall. I mean, you, you know, it, again, it's like I, I, I equate it to like being, you know, killed off by the writers on a TV show, except in this case, the writers of the TV show wasn't the dungeon master, right? It was the chat, um, you know, they saw what the 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 audience <laughs> what the audience wanted out of the show um and and they leaned into it and they took it they handled it really well and they um they really played it up and um, you know i i have confidence in tim to be able to deliver but uh you know bob 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 had a nice one so that was really really great um not a question but total entropy at death did the boss the party not make it to the boss at book at the end of book 3 uh no they did not uh they they died shortly. If everything had gone according to plan, they probably would have been fighting him this next Tuesday. Now, granted, that fight would have also been an extreme fight, and I don't know how that would have ended either. So, um, God, I love Blade so much. So do I. Love it. Probably one of my top three favorite systems. Uh, da da da. I like your logic behind hero points, but I feel the wheel of pain mechanic kind of undermines the idea. Then, yeah, I mean. It was an experiment that I got way out of control and I didn't expect for that to happen. So uh, it was very nice. Um, Matt. Yeah. So I don't well, actually, I like villain points even less um, because then it's really stupid because a hero goes, I upgrade that to a crit and I go, I downgrade that to a hit. And then the hero goes, well, I upgrade that to a hit. And I go, well, I downgrade that to a normal hit. And, and villain points don't really work for me in that regard. Um, so I don't really like him in that, in that situation. Um, doo -doo -doo. ruin, uh, if I'm correct, I gave everybody steal yours resolve. That's exactly, I gave it to them for free effectively. Yes. 
Um, I don't understand why the wheel is so vilified while the hero points were not seen with the negative effect. Be because the hero points effect is far more subtle. Um, and and uh, arguably, there are effects on the wheel of pain that are way more powerful than any one hero point or even any four hero points distributed to four heroes. Um, do I think that, uh, you know, the chat spending, you know, $25 to make everybody in the party um, frighten one uh, is more powerful? No, I do not. But do I think a hero point is more powerful than that? Yes, yes, I do. Um, but I think it's because you saw some of the the hardest hitting elements on the Wheel of Pain in that last session. And I think that's why it's so vilified. Also, you know, nobody likes, it's, it's tough to cheer for the bad guys. You know, it's, there's a natural proclivity to want the good guys to win, to want the protagonists to overcome. And so we have a natural aversion to people who support the bad side. Um, let's see here. Da -da, da -da. That is, yes, if you if you do play Rules of Witten after two, two extreme encounters, the odds would be that uh, they will be dead. Yes, that is true. Um, what else we got here? I'm looking for other questions. New campaign? What's the plan? We're still figuring that out. I mean, we're going to do something, right? I mean, it's, it's fun to get down here and play, and um, I don't know what the exact situation is. I know that we have... Uh, you know, we have players, we have, uh, we even have some folks in the Patreon who, who have sort of signed up to sort of be, uh, you know, backup characters as needed. Maybe we can, we can tap, tap into the triple A, triple A club. If, if we want to get some different games going, there are some people who want to see other types of games besides Pathfinder two, because, you know, this is a great opportunity for them to sort of learn and explore and see us playing different types of games. Um, but there's also people who really want to see more Pathfinder two stuff and, I want to see more Pathfinder 2 stuff I, as a as a as a sort of a game designer, which I'm not, but as someone who you know thinks about games a lot, I uh, I would love to sort of experiment with more Pathfinder 2 home rules and home based content and sort of published content. And I think having a Pathfinder 2 game is a is a great way as a vehicle for sort of exploring that space. So yeah, um, I don't know. I don't 100 percent know yet. Um, Let's see. Da, 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 da. Any more questions? No one with the big question tag. Uh, <laughs> Frank said, yeah, they didn't even equip before going up the mountain. No, they did not. It's a good thing that uh, Tim took those fifth level endure element spells uh, because they would have been in, they would have been really trouble in trouble then. Uh, but you know, that, that was sort of an ongoing theme. I think in the, in the game is that, uh, you know, like they didn't loot any of the ogres in the one series of adventures. And, um, uh, they kind of just, you know, trolled their way through. And um, there were some times where I think it, it did it did hurt them long before they ever got wiped by the, you know, Wheel of Pain. I'm saying even in prior adventures. Um, yeah, that that was very excessive, Matt. Three spins over two turns. It might have even been more than that. It might have been four spins. Uh, it, it, it obviously was too much. I mean, we we can't. We cannot and we will not do that going forward because either way, because the first session where everybody tipped to all the heroes that broke the game, uh, it didn't end the game because the characters being too powerful will never end your game. Um, but in, in the last session, it went too far the other way and that will end your game. Um, but either of those outcomes is fundamentally unacceptable to me going forward. And I have accepted I've said this in the Patreon. I said this in the after party. If you're a champion or hero tier of our Patreon, we stay on our Zoom call and let our uh, higher tier people come in and just chat with us as soon as the game is over. Um, as I said in that, I accept the fact that I am going to change the rules of these games. We are going to make a lot less money because people are not going to be as incentivized to tip. They're not going to be able to tip their favorite hero. They're not going to be able to uh, tip the GM. Uh, having, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure who it was, but it might have been Lazarus Dark who said, like, I think fundamentally, I'm not sure I might be putting words in their mouth, but they basically said, like, fundamentally, when you're dealing with the Internet, like, you're going to have people who are going to try to troll your campaign one way or the other. Uh, and I don't disagree with that. And, you know, this group probably that, you know, that tip for all the evil stuff to spin, they probably wouldn't do that again. But that's not to say that 
as the Patreon continues to grow or the channel continues to grow, that, you know, four or five episodes from now, you won't get another group of people who just want to do the same thing. Uh, and again, um, it doesn't seem like it, but like that first session when the heroes had six or seven or eight hero points each, um, I actually had to download a mod for Foundry to be able to allow the characters to have more than three hero points uh, because up until that point in the game, no one had ever had more than like three. Um, and, and that was like after saving up for an entire adventure because I used to maybe give out maybe one or two hero points every other session or so. Uh, and so as, when that happened in the game, I thought, oh, okay, well, this game is already ruined. Like I can't, how, what can I, as a GM, I couldn't beat, one or two hero points. I can't beat seven or eight hero points. When the characters have that many, like any boss that they encounter is just instantly dead. Um, so that ruined the game, but it continued because again, when the heroes are really strong, uh, it could continue. And then the wheel of pain ruined the game that last session. Uh, but when that happens, it ends the game. So yeah. Um, yes. And to be fair, I mean, I was trying to create and get, I, I was, look, I was trying to create some hype for our damn AP because I was sick and tired of nobody giving a damn about it and nobody watching it. And like, I, which is fine. I will, I happily play role-playing games in the privacy of my own home or my friend's home uh, and, you know, with no audience and I do it for free. So I'm happy to do that. But, you know, there's a lot of extra effort that goes into doing this. And I'm like, well, look, if I'm going to go through all this rigmarole and I'm going to put it on the internet, like, we might as well try to make it interesting or at least get some money out of it or at least get some some crazy action that you can't get anywhere else. Um, <laughs> I do agree uh, that the last call was a very poetic way to go out. I mean, you, you can't write that, right? You can't write that. That just happened. That was literally random from random people on the internet tipping to a random wheel that had like over 50 items on it. And that was the last one. Come on. Come on. I know everybody died, but come on. That was pretty sweet. Uh, the money was insane. Um, we have the best audience. I agree. I don't even need to read the rest of it, but I do agree with it. Even if it's small, it's all people with jobs and disposition to spend on hobbies. Yeah. I mean, gamers in general, uh, tend to be, uh, I think in my experience for many, many years going to conventions and seeing other people, gamers in general, uh, tend to be more, uh, generous and, and willing to, you know, donate and willing to spend money on their niche hobby. So I really do appreciate that. Um, yeah, the wheel did slow down, you know, battles before. Although it's one of those interesting things because I, I, if I had one complaint even before it killed everybody, my number one complaint about the wheel of pain was that it did slow down the, the pites. But what's interesting is in all of our previous games that we've ever played, um, we never got through more than two fights ever. Um, I, I just feel like all fights in Pathfinder 2 take an, an hour... And an hour and a half. I don't, I don't, maybe that's just this group and me. Maybe I'm just very slow as a game master. Um, but like whenever we sit down for like a two or three hour session, uh, you know, we, we get through three fights. We, uh, on Friday nights, we play uh, Mr. Aaron Smith. William Brandis in the chat is our GM. We play for five hours. We play from midnight or seven to midnight, roughly. And there are uh, three, three to four fights in the session. Sometimes three uh if if there's an extra skill type challenge and then four if there's not um i might even be getting that wrong well, no i'm sorry there's two to three fights there's either one fight two skill challenges and a boss fight or there's two fights one skill challenge and then a boss fight so it's two to three fights and uh we, we, it always comes down to the wire like we're always worried we're gonna run out of time we're gonna have to go home uh because it's just so hard to get through fights um, squeezing arm says that 90 minute combat seems standard to me. Yeah. It, it, it's crazy to me how, how long it is, you know, um, <laughs> Hunter was always roll twice. Yeah. That's pretty brutal as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate people talking about ways to balance it out and all that other stuff, but fundamentally the whole concept is broken. Um, you know, so, um, 
Yeah, and I uh, I agree with uh, Nolan Inquisitor here. You know, I do think it did, did remove an, a sense of fairness from the game. I agree with that. I think both did. Um, you know, if I had a really cool, interesting, balanced, uh, but yet balanced to be challenging uh, boss fight, and the party just is horrible, but Bob has four hero points, and so he crits with his first attack, and then he takes his map attack, and he hits, so he makes that a crit, like... That's, those are two events that should not have happened. It should have only happened if he had rolled double nat 20s. So that event of Bob critting twice in a row uh, against a monster that's higher than him, that he can only crit on a 20, uh, should only happen one in 400 times. Do you know how many times that happened? A lot, a lot. Um, and, and what could have been a really interesting and engaging game of uh, battle became kind of a joke because, you know, I mean, Xanisha is the best example of this. This really hyped up boss, um, and she died in, in one round because Bob spent three hero points uh in a go so and now and that and that was three hero points that he gained over the course from levels five to seven he gained a total of three hero points he literally saved all of them then he now he was getting three or four hero points five hero points per session it was unsustainable it could not be it could not understandable um ed cruz uh that i think is a valid statement you know um the wheel is very profitable i like that luckily this is not my full-time job. Um, you know, if this was how I was paying my mortgage or rent, I would be telling you people to, you know, well, sorry, that's just the way it is. If people want to see this, this is what we're going to do. Um, but uh, it's not, you know, this is a fun hobby uh, that has sort of transitioned to a part-time job. And it's a fun part-time job. But I'm okay with it not making me, you know, oodles and oodles and oodles of cash. Um, you know, if, if the if this live streams are fun and they're engaging and my players are interested and want to be a part of this action, um, and we'll do it. And if we don't make as much money, you know, then we won't make as much money. Um, yeah, the Jason, a plus five is probably better than a plus 10. I mean, that's essentially, by the way, what my hero points did. They, they basically virtually gave you a plus 10. Um, torn between RIP and good riddance to the modded hero points. Going to lead towards good riddance. Um... Yeah, I, again, for me as a GM personally, you know, you can't help but be a little bit defensive, you know. Um, I was fine with them until Azius had the ability to gain uh, knockdown. I mean, I think the critical specialization effect on hammers and flails is way too powerful. Knocking a creature prone on a critical hit is too strong. Full stop. Um, with no save. And um, just full stop. And, like, all the other stuff is either relatively inconsequential, like uh, you get shoved five feet, or, you know, you get slowed or stunned, but you get to make a force save against their class DC. This is the only effect that is just brutal. It's just, it's absolutely brutalizing. It knocks them prone. And, and if the creature, if the barbarian or the fighter who is knocking you prone has attack of opportunity, it is such a brutal combo of, of, of confluences that I can't even begin to discuss how powerful and painful that is. Um, you know, and Bob had the wombo combo. He had the fear rune in the hammer. So when Bob ever got a hit, He'd spend a hero point, it'd be a critical hit, he would do like 80 or 90 damage, and the creature would essentially have a minus four penalty to its AC. It'd be flat-footed, and it would be frightened too. And then its choices are either uh, waste its whole turn, attack from the ground with a penalty, or stand up, and then provoke an attack of opportunity with all those same penalties. Um, and then after standing up, because the rule that we changed to, we did change the real rule, the attack of opportunity occurs after you stand up, which means Bob could then crit on that and spend a hero point, and then just knock the creature back prone again. So after Bob gained that ability... I really hated my modded hero points. Um, <laughs> although I do agree just, uh, making them an after effect fortune is better than the current iteration. Yeah, I don't like the current iteration at all either. Um, so ugh, it's not it's not as good. Um, what about letting hero points raise the character's rolls one step but not affecting the NPC save? Still too strong. Yes, Chris, for just the reason that I just described. For just the reason. Um, if anything, I would love for to come up with a code hero point system and then have all the characters make all the roles. And then they then they could spend their hero points, but the characters are making all the roles, and I, the GM, will never have to make another die roll again. That I would love. Um doo -doo -doo. as we said, Vin is almost always right. Um all right, sorry guys, I'm catching up here. Uh, Lilifolia, we uh, sort of changed that a little bit. Well, for starters, um, 
he was already at dying three, but also we changed it that you needed three hero points because uh, in my game, people were getting so many hero points that if you could do that, otherwise it's like you would essentially become in invincible as long as the chat would always feed you one hero point because you would go down and in my game, hero point, uh, if you spend it, you don't. You didn't avoid going dying. You went to one hit point, max stamina. You grabbed all your weapons and you stood up without provoking attacks of opportunity. Um, so it was really, really powerful because I wanted you know you to be like, no, this is my last stand. But you could theoretically create a system where a hero could have just one hero point, go get knocked down, spend the hero point, come back, have their stamina and one hit point. The chat gives them another hero point at that exact instant and now they can fight 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 and then when they go down again they spend that hero point to come back and then the chat gives them another hero point and so you can keep them into sort of this infinite loop um oh okay yeah william brian just explained it um Yeah, I wouldn't say complete failure. TPKs do happen even without a bloodthirsty audience. And again, I'm, I mean, I understand it was a crazy, weird, bumpy road that got us to that situation. Um, uh, but, you know, at that point, we were we were there, right? The group was beaten up. They were bloodied. They were battered. Tim was dead. And, you know, everything that gotten to that point was definitely influenced or caused by Wheel of Pain, particularly Tim's death. Um, and at that point, you know, that spilled milk under the bridge, but the you know the group uh, didn't want to retreat. And once they went into the dungeon, uh, I mean the fate was their fate was already pretty rough. But then they they def the the audience and the chat definitely sealed it with the uh, horrificness and the horribleness and the true unleashed sadistic valor of the wheel of pain. Um. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I do think that we, we went WWE here, right? Where it's too much flash and not enough substance. And it made us a lot of money, which is to say something, right? Which is like, hey, when we were playing bog standard, it wasn't even bog standard because we were using my hero points. But when we were, uh, when we were, when we were playing bog standard Pathfinder 2, no one gave a shit about us. <laughs> <laughs> no one watched for anything. We made, uh, if, we, if YouTube could have made us negative dollars. In fact, it was actually, it got to, it got to be really funny. Um, I'm almost caught up, by the way, but... Um, I, I know there's some super chats I'm going to talk about, but, um, uh, so don't worry if, if you said that, but like when we started publishing like, um, uh, nightlife and three action economy video and the combat and tactics videos, and we started doing, um, all those other videos, uh, scheduling started to become a problem, uh, with some of the folks. And we used to, the APs basically became almost like a once every two to three week, uh, kind of publish instead of like a once a week publish. But, and at some points it actually became like a once a month published, but we were publishing these other videos all the time. Cause like Bob and I could get together and we could like publish these videos and they were doing really well. They were getting tons of views, thousands and thousands of views and really jading ourselves. And then we would launch, we would publish an AP video. And like the, the next day I would get like a notification from YouTube, you know, it'd be like, YouTube would be like, it, you know, it, it gives you these like, like, you know, when you publish a video, it'd be like, hey, great job. Your new video is doing really great. You're getting a lot of action and click through rates. Impressions are up 75%. Great job. But whenever I would publish an AP, YouTube would be like, oh no, I'm sorry. It, it looks like your most recent video just wasn't a success. Maybe think about your title, your thumbnail, or your content and consider doing something different. After all, engagement is very important and, and your audience seems to really dislike this video. So think about doing something different next time. And like it happened every time we published our AP and it like became really, really like It almost like was a joke that like YouTube was basically like penalizing us. It was punishing us um, because when we publish an AP, we would get such low click through rates that, YouTube would say, okay, these chan this channel is not one that engages well with our audience. It's not one that engages well with their, their own audience. And when we publish another video, YouTube would say, oh, it's from that channel. They don't get good you know, any interaction with their audience. We're not going to show their video to anybody. So we discovered that when we didn't publish APs, um, we actually would get better, uh, you know, YouTube traction with the algorithm. Um, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> what 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 WTF is my cat trip going to do? against 180, 160 XP of extra monsters, and the answer is nothing. No, that roll 
is unless the group is like in a moderate fight and they've got it well under control and they've got a good bank of hero points, um, that role is very, 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 very impossible to overcome. So the answer is nothing. Um, uh, we talked about this one. Sorry about that. But I think I answered that. Yep. Here we're getting here. Da, 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 da. <laughs> the wheel of get good. Yeah. I mean, 80, 70% of the wheel was get good. 20% of the get good. Uh, the wheel was like, all right, this is, this is questionable. 10% of the wheel was just like, this is brutally harsh. Uh, and, and really shouldn't, you know, is, 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 oh, is way too bad. Now, granted, I think in many circumstances, if the group had seven or eight hero points, I think they would have won that fight um, like they did in the previous session, uh, but they didn't. So. Uh, da, 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 da. Jason, uh, it, it is, but spell attack spells don't have those. Spell attack spells do nothing on a miss. So like a fireball is balanced because a fireball, if the creature makes it save, uh, you know, you don't have that bonus to your DC. Uh, but if the creature makes a save, it takes half damage. Um, a spell like slow, if the creature makes it save, it's still slowed one for one round instead of slowed one for one minute. But a spell attack spell like um, Searing Light or Acid Arrow or Scorching Ray or, uh, geez, um well, the one version of Horizon Thunder Sphere or any of those other spell attack spells, if you miss, you just do nothing. Um, doo -doo. All right. Um, what are we getting to here? Rosemary, I might have missed this one here, did I? Oh, uh, Rosemary the Witch Pyre said uh, another vote for Monster Hearts. That's funny. Um, oh, I didn't know we had so many Monster Hearts fans in the in the audience. Um, all right, sorry, we're getting finally caught up here. Um, Squeezing Arm said I watched Rise of the Rulers up until you went live. Couldn't catch it ever. With that said, love the Night School stuff. That's where you should go with the focus gaming and secondary. Yeah, we really like the Night School stuff, but ironically. Night School stuff is like our worst performing video ever uh, series. Uh, that video series does horrible for us. Like it does worse than anything we've ever done before. In fact, that's why we did two episodes of it and then we stopped doing it. The only reason, if you want to thank anybody for there being a Night School 3 and Bob and I are about to do Night School 4, it's because of the patrons. Uh, because they pay and support us uh, and they said, hey, we think that series is really great. We would love to see more of that. We said, you know what? This is a loser for us in terms of YouTube engagement and algorithm and the videos are really long. They only target GMs. They don't target, uh, you know, everybody. They don't target players, right? Most people, 80% plus or whatever are players. So really you should be making videos that are player focused or all players plus GM focused that, you know, are lower level 5e. Like that's like the, the target market, right? This is like the opposite of that. It's it's arguably system agnostic, but there's definitely a Pathfinder 2 focus. It's GM focus. It's really philosophical. It's mechanical. It's deep. And quite frankly, it's about building adventures and dungeons in a way that a lot of people don't build dungeons and adventures anymore. Nowadays, people don't write, make maps and they don't make dungeons. They don't make adventures. They write a plot or a story and then they have their players go on their little adventure, um, uh, choose your own adventure plot. So, uh, you know. That is uh that is the case. Um all right. Here we go. I think we're almost caught up. So if I miss something, I apologize. Now that we're on the topic of TPKs and when things do go bad, would you mind talking about your thoughts on handling player death in TPKs outside of the low levels? Um yeah. I mean I think TPKs and player death is what make these games interesting uh, and make them different from a video game with a save point and all that other stuff. I mean, obviously, these the, for higher level characters, there exists the ability to raise dead and all this other stuff. Um, and if players uh, have access to that, I mean, they should absolutely 
uh, tap into that and use that. But I don't even know um, that I like that. I'm, I don't, I'm not a player very often. And, you know, there are certain circumstances where if my character dies, I do want to be brought back because I, I, there are things that I want to do with my character, but there are also plenty of circumstances. And I've had plenty of players in my game who have died and said, I'm fine not being raised from the dead. I, for me, it seems like it is an ending. And I like that there is an ending, you know, in Lord of the Rings, Boromir's sacrifice is uh, awesome and amazing because he's dead. If, you know, the next scene, they dragged him to Lothlorien and, you know, Galadriel cast Ray's dead on him, it really loses a lot of the impact and the sting. Now, you're balancing, right, between what is fun as a game versus what is sort of interesting and involving as a dramatic narrative. Um, and I think you do have to, you know, balance that. Um, I've also had games where, you know, I not D and D, but like where like other games where I've said, well, like Thirteenth Age is one where I said, hey, so before we get into this um, campaign, do you guys want to be able to die? And uh, the, my players, my, Matt Holloway was one of my players in this campaign. He said they all voted. They said, no, no, we don't want to be able to die. Like it, only if I want to die should we be able to die. Now that doesn't mean that they can't fail. That doesn't mean that they can't fail and have consequences. But it means that outside of them picking a spot and being like, yep, this is a dramatic moment where I think my character would die. We're taking that off the table. Um, and if you're not taking that off the table, then you should be upfront about that with your players and say, Hey, this is a game where your character could die and ha has a reasonable chance of doing that. And before you go and spend a hundred dollars on a custom mini, be aware of that. On the other hand, if your players say, Hey, we don't really think that's part of what we want to do in our game, then you need to decide if that's the kind of game that you want to run. So uh, for me, for TPK, I don't like sweeping it under the rug. I don't like being like, okay, everybody's dead. And you know, your twin brothers and sisters show up the next week and it's, you know, Bazius and Bwildor and, uh, and we'll just flip the page to the next encounter and we'll just keep going like nothing happened. Of course you could play like that. That is basically what a video game is, except, you know, in a video game, you get to keep playing the same character. You just reload from the save point and keep going. I like something different than that. And I think my players uh, know that. Um, oh, shit. Thank you, my squeezing arm. We try. Actually, we don't, but I've got, I've got like 60 pounds of COVID weight I need to lose. So that's fun. It's been tough. My gym was closed. I built one inside my house and then I still haven't used it. Um, uh, what are you thinking about doing with hero points now to balance it? Are you going back to raw? I'm not going back to raw, but I am definitely getting rid of my current form. But what I am leaning on most likely right now is a variant uh, from Mutants and Masterminds, uh, which was uh, produced by Green Ronin. The third edition superhero game. And in it, uh, if you spend a hero point, you get to make a reroll on a D20. But uh, if you roll between one and a 10, it's treated as an 11 through 20. So basically, you're not rolling a D20. You're basically rolling a D10 plus 10. So your results are on the reroll are between 11 and 20. Uh, how would you have handled using resolve to get spells for someone who was a primary marshal with a caster archetype? I mean, same way. I mean, at that point, you're just trying to have it all anyways and have your cake and eat it too. I mean, you can't have it all. I mean, if you're a primary marshal and your free archetype is caster and you're out of spells, I don't feel as bad for you as I feel bad for a someone who is only a primary caster and they are out of spells. Um, Vince started, what systems would we like pull in the Discord? I am eager to look it out. I, I'm, I imagine there will be some trolls in there as well. Um, interest, any interest is... Any interest in Hyperbe Hyperborea, third edition came out. Um, I mean, I'm a big Conan fan. Uh, I own Barbarians of Lemuria. I own some other sword and sandal type stuff. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't really know that system. So, yeah. Matthew Brune says, hey, homebrew Hexcrawl. Uh, I've soured a little bit on Hexcrawls uh, from, from my youth. I... Uh, I kind of like abstract point crawls now more than hex crawls. Um, have I seen Into the Wild and Weird, a system agnostic spooky woods setting? Nope. 
No, I have not. If that's something that's for sale, maybe I'll check it out. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Is there another adventure path that you want to try? Um, I was, I am interested in Quest for the Frozen Flame, and the reason for it is, um, so my relationship with adventure paths is this. Uh, my favorite RPG moments and games are ones where, as a game master, I do almost no prep, and I have nothing prepared, and I have no stats in front of me, and nothing. And I've run numerous campaigns like that. They were not D&D or Pathfinder games. And the reason why they weren't D&D and Pathfinder games is it is very hard or damn near impossible to run those games no prep or zero prep. Um, and so those games tend to rely on you doing a lot of work. And so there is a very strong benefit for having an AP in that situation because it gives you all the monsters and stats. I don't like that they tend to be fairly, in my opinion, railroady. Um, Abomination Vaults was a lot of fun for me because it didn't seem as railroady as some other APs that I have read. That all being said, Quest for the Frozen Flame did interest me simply because that is not the type of setting or genre that I have ever played before or GM before. And I think it's kind of, it's cool in an interesting way uh, that uh, the setting is what is enticing me. In fact, despite, uh, I mean, of course it is because it's Pathfinder 2. You know, they make this whole thing about how here's how alchemists and gunsmiths and, uh, you know, inventors could be part. I would I would throw all that out. Like, if I was playing a Crest for the Frozen Flame game, you could not be an alchemist. You could not be, uh, you know, unless you were some sort of, like, free archetype alchemist with, like, being, like, a cleric or, like, a shaman. And so it was more like you were a you know, like a witch doctor and you were making potions and talismans, but like the, you know, the 19 or the 1800s Victorian alchemist that we all think about the sort of Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde, uh, mad scientist alchemist that's right out. No guns and, you know, avoiding all of these crazy kooky, um, ancestries and classes and really focusing on like this sort of, uh, sort of primeval tribal culture, uh, that's like, you know, for me, it's very reminiscent of the um, the wildlings from Game of Thrones who live north of the wall and like a very sort of nomadic hunter based hunter gatherer based uh, culture with a lot of pride and honor, but also, you know, sort of a brutal, almost kind of a Fremen esque, you know, kind of a, a feel to it, not in the desert, but in the harsh, de uh, cold waste. And those are both cultures, the, the, you know, the wildlings or the free folk from Game of Thrones and the Fremen from Dune that I, I really, uh, I think is really cool. So that one does interest me. I will admit. Um, Damien says I'm uh, overestimating the tip drop off. Well, Damien, we will see. I, you know, I, 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 and rightfully so it should tip off, drop off. You know, part of the thing is I, I, I People, people tipped because they wanted to show their support for a character and they get something for it. I do think it's going to, I do think it's going to fall off. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you being here for the AP and for the PF2 e combat. Um, <laughs> balance the wheel items. Some are a bit extreme. We are in agreement. Yeah. The, the wheel, the wheel is going bye-bye. Let's put it that way. Um, all right. Did someone say active defense? I did, Vin. Um, I did say active defense. I, I love not rolling dice as a GM. Nothing makes me happier than a game system where I don't ever have to roll dice. Blades in the Dark, I don't roll dice. Play, powered by the Apocalypse games like Dungeon World or Monster Hearts, I don't roll dice. I love it. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, my favorite game system right now is probably Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, the Legend of the Five Rings from 5th Edition. Uh from Fantasy Flight Games. It's their 5th edition, but it's not D&D 5th edition. It's Legend of the Five Rings. 5th um, edition. I love it. It's a great game. It's not 100% fully cooked. It, you know, like, there's still some elements of the game that I think are a little bit wonky and could have used some more development experience. But I'm not as critical of that because it's doing so many different things in a, such a unique, interesting way. This isn't like 
D&D 5th edition or Pathfinder where it's like, okay, this recipe has been around for 50 years. You should have gotten it right. Like this is wholly new, treading new ground from a very small company uh, without the sort of budget and overstate. So I, I give them a pass. But my only co- real big complaint about it is I have to roll dice. If like I could figure out a way to change the rules of that game so that I didn't have to roll dice, it, it would be, I, we wouldn't be playing Pathfinder 2 right now. We'd be playing Legend of the Five Rings 5th edition. Um uh, we this is I, we're, I'm reading up to the chat from now and when I was talking about how powerful hammers and flails are. Yeah, knocking prone is way too strong. I, knocking prone is way too strong. All the other weapons are mostly too weak. Bows are a joke. Um, uh, swords are a joke. Um, fatal being given to the pick is outrageously stupid. Um, you know, like axes should have fatal. Um, that's why they use them in executions and they didn't use picks. Um, the weapons in Pathfinder 2 are a joke and they need to be completely redone. Um, it's horrible. The way, what they did to weapons in that game is awful. Um, that's correct, Gabriel. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, it's so strong. I want to crit every time. Um, uh, Derek, please elaborate on my hex roll question if you want. Will not remind again because of your show. Oh yeah, sorry, squeezing arm. Um, I, I, I don't know what your hex crawl question was. Sorry. Um, if you're still here in my squeezing arm, ask ask again what your hex crawl question was. And if I didn't answer it, maybe I can answer it again. Um, let's see. All right. Maybe it's a time for two channels. Yeah, you know, we thought about that, Chris Monroe, but we're just so small that dividing our player bases, like, like if I put my APs into a different channel, that channel won't be monetized for a, a year. And then I can't even turn on donations and tips. Like, we would lose a lot of money if we did that. So it's it's very hard. Um. Uh, okay, my, I forgot to mention a bunch of folks in the Battle Zoo. A bunch of folks in the Battle Zoo community thought you were a bit harsh. The staff loved you, but the community felt terrible. It was rough. Anything you want to say there? Yeah, I mean, some designs are terrible. I don't. <laughs> I mean, not everybody makes the best stuff in the game. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Um, again, I my my props to the the editors because my rankings of terrible. My percentage lined up with their ratings. Um, you know, I, I didn't feel like as the as you know, you went up from silver to gold to platinum, there were less and less percentage of terrible things. Um, you know, it, look, I, look, I respect anybody who makes uh, a monster, but um, I think some designs are just bad. I think some designs are uninteresting, and um, you know, like a movie critic, there are certain things that. You know, you could argue, well, I thought this movie was horrible. And someone will say, well, there is a group of people who really like this movie. Well, then your argument is that the the media form of critique is inherently pointless. I mean, that is that is what critique is. It's me saying, based on these criteria, I thought these monsters were terrible. Um, and I think the staff appreciated that. And I think they even called us out in their role for combat chat because uh, and their live stream uh, because they understand that, I mean... They probably thought some of those monsters were terrible too. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh my gosh. Okay, sorry. We're getting all cut up here. So many. Um, all right, I got some self I got some self confessed. I got some chicks to do here. Um, question, you've discussed how the various videos are doing, but how is the podcast doing? I absolutely love the different opinions between you, Bob, and Aaron. It's doing, we're getting more listens with every episode, but, um, which is great, but it makes us no money. It's not monetized, um, at all. Um, we don't have any sponsors for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, but we like doing it because it's fun. It requires almost no work. Uh, Ben from the, uh, from the Patreon is an audio engineer, uh, and he loves, he helps us out. He's great at it. He, he puts like the audio finishing touches on it and, and does the edit for us. So it's hands off. He does it, you know, God bless him. And, um, 
uh, but it's fun to just sit there and, and and kind of BS for three hours and not worry about the film and the footage and, you know, be a little bit more relaxed and loose and have that long form content, not worry about algorithms and people getting bored or whatever. Um, and it's not monetized and we don't really expect to make any money with it. So, but, you know, we like doing it. Um, we use Foundry Neon of Night through and we host it on a Forge server. Um. The gist was that terrible or unplayable stung a bit. Some folks thought it was an attack on the community who submitted the creatures. Honestly, I I think, I, I said on there, I said that professional, like best Jerry one, two, three, monster manual, one, two, three. I feel like 50% of the monsters in those books are unplayable. So for me to say that only like 10% of the monsters in Battle Zoo Bestiary were unplayable. I thought it was like the highest praise I've ever given to a battle, uh, a bestiary book or a monster book ever. I hate monster books. And I gave that one an A. I thought it was great. <laughs> People are so weird. Um, But the staff were happy. Yeah, because they have a sense of perspective and they have a sense of, of understanding. Um. Yeah, and I graded it just on the best Jerry stuff. I thought all the hunting stuff was stupid. Bob loved it, but you know that I'm not going to let one subsection just because I don't think that's interesting or in a, a cool design space, you know, be really interesting. Yeah, we all gave it an A. So I think Aaron gave it an A plus. So, um, uh, how about Warhammer or Zwihanda? Zwihanda is a bit too much for me, honestly. I looked through the book and I was like, oh god, the Flames of War too, right? It's the same system. I think it's called Flames of War. Uh, Warhammer. The thing about Warhammer is like you have to, I feel like it's fun when you have people who really, really know the lore. Like I really know the war, lore, Warhammer. Uh, I play Warhammer Fantasy Battles fourth from 4th edition to ninth edition um, or 8th edition, whatever the last edition was before Age of Sigmar. Once Age of Sigmar came out, I immediately stopped. I never played another game again because it was horrible. Um, yeah, RuneQuest in general, like BRP systems, uh, BRP, BR. Basic fantasy role playing. Uh, those systems uh, haven't always historically been my favorite. So, you know, uh, Galarian in depth voting for Quest for Frozen Flame. Thank you, Galarian depth for the super chat. Uh, it would be fun to watch. It would be great to watch. Um, yeah, I think it could be fun as well. I think that would be really interesting, and I think it'd be uh, a fun, certainly a fun difference. And for me as a GM, it would be an interesting option. If I did Quest for the Frozen Flame, though, I would be doing it because. I would want, I know this is going to sound controversial, I would want a more, and I'm going to use a term just so that we are speaking the same language, but this is not what I mean. I would want it to be a more role-playing and narrative-focused game. What do I mean by that? I don't mean, you know, I'm speaking in character. I mean, I, I would want there to be more... Um, understanding and exploring these characters and seeing them react to situations as their imaginary character would and figuring out ways to create compelling moments that were not pre-scripted but generated through the dice rolls and allow that to sort of guide the storyline um that's really where my headspace has been that's one of the reasons why i really like legend of the five rings so much right now is i love what that game does mechanically with role-playing and a way that it mechanically rewards and incentivizes role playing. I like that a lot. Um, uh, Zan Gungsun, if I like DM Dice Roll, the cipher system might be something. I was a original Kickstarter for Numenera, uh, and Aaron currently still is borrowing my book. Um, yeah, I think the cipher system is really really fun. Numenera is a little weird because it's like that dying Earth post apocalyptic, but ten thousand years in the future type thing. But uh, you know, the cipher system as a whole, I think is a a plus. I think there's a lot going on there that I really, really like. Um, maybe use a wheel of destiny, but mod it with some effects that are more beneficial to the party without a cost. So you have good and bad things on it. Again, my plan right now is to blow everything up and start from the bottom and kind of reevalu really evaluate what I want out of the game. Um, and uh, you know, if I if it's even worth the hassle um, and the the bother. Um, I think Hell's Rebels would be a fun AP for you. That's one of the ones I don't really know that well. Okay, my squeezing arm. I'm sorry. Question was a super chat. I, I apologize. Uh, Tio, any tips for running a hex crawl or any plans to make content for it? I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I feel like I'm over planning. 
And I think you nailed it. I think the issue with a hex crawl is it tends to lead towards over planning. You know, if you look at my night school videos, um, that one of the things I like, I love about dungeons is you can let the players basically hex crawl in the dungeon. And this is, yep, you can go anywhere you want, but there's only 18 rooms in this level. And I only had to design 18 things and you can be as free form as you want. You can go wherever you want, but by definition, you can't go to a room that's not there. So you are, you have freedom and constraint at the same time. And it's like the perfect balance. It's like years ago, I started taking my mom on a vacation for mother's day as sort of a reward for saying, Hey, you, you were a great mom. And I'm going to take you on vacation every year, mother's day, all expense paid. And at first we went to, you know, we did Vegas, we did some other trips, which was fine, but she was a little nervous and, uh, I didn't like leaving her unsupervised. Like when we were in Las Vegas, my mom's like, oh, I'm going to go play in a poker tournament. And I go, uh, you know, I feel like I got to keep, you know, an eye on her and I don't. So what we started doing, we started doing cruises. And the reason why we started doing cruises is because I was like, look, she's on the boat. There's staff and support everywhere. She can go and she can go see a show and she can go down to the casino and she can gamble. She can go up to the top deck and sit by the pool side. And I can go like read a book by the bar or I can go, you know, take in a concert or whatever. We can meet up for dinner, but I don't have to worry about her because she can only go where there is on the boat and everywhere on the boat is somewhere that is fairly controlled. And so the same thing is kind of true with a dungeon. A hex crawl is like my mom being in Las Vegas. I have no idea where she's going to go. I have no idea where she's going to end up. And it can be really tough and it can really lead to uh, a sense of feeling uh, overwhelmed. My recommendation is focus on um, creating good tables and charts. I think rather than trying to fill in every hex with something interesting or something to do, I would focus on creating just a handful of interesting discoveries, locations, sites, places, and then create some really, or, or beg, borrow, or steal. There's a lot of these things out there on the internet nowadays between old school Renaissance resources and some other resources, um, like things like World Without Numbers or the Tome of Adventure Design, link below in the doobly-doo for Tome of Adventure Design. Um, if, you, if you focus on random emergent content and then sort of try to make sense of it, then you can have this really cool experience that no one was expecting to have. And you can use those tables. This is the thing that people don't understand. You can, the tables become the adventure. So if you have a region and you know that that region is, you know, uh, is known as dangerous, it's called, it's called the, the Wyvern Hills. And why is it called the Wyvern Hills? Because there is several dens of Wyverns in that area. And so this random encounter table that you build has a lot of wyverns on there. And it doesn't always have to be a fight, right? An encounter could be something like you see a wyvern uh, dive bombing a prey, you know, at the far distance of your site. It's just enough to kind of give you that feel of like, oh, this is a dangerous location. Or maybe you see signs of a wyvern attack, or maybe you are attacked by a wyvern. And that chart becomes the sort of adventure for that area and it can even lead you and your players onto some sort of whole other quest because they might say, well, why are there so many wyverns in this area? And what was just random encounter could end up spawning like this whole huge quest thing where it's like, oh, there's an ancient dragon god that sleeps beneath the rock and he was petrified a million years ago or whatever. And the, the drakes and the wyvern are drawn to it like moths to a flame. And, you know, it could just turn into this whole cool thing. And the players would go, wow, did you plan all that? Was that written all out? And you go, no, that was just a random encounter that just took off a life on its own. So for me, I think the key to wilderness exploration um, is good random tables and also allow the players. Don't be afraid to pull back the curtain. The, 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 the nature of a role-playing game is one from the narrative elements, the simulation elements and the game elements to talk to each other, to mechanically talk to each other. Um, <laughs> Dark council tips $50 for the forge. Thank you, Dark Council, for ending our game. Thank you for the tip. I'm not sure who that was, but I, I appreciate the $50 tip. Thank you so much. And we reached our $100 uh, Knights of Last Call Retirement uh, Memorial Fund tip, so I appreciate that as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, but, yeah, so 
let the players know. Like if they do research in town or they see tracks, I do one of my favorite things I love to do is like if like a ranger character or someone with survival like makes a tracking check while they're in an area, I'll say, "Oh, you see signs of X, Y, and Z." And then I'll let them know and I go, "Hey, the random encounter table is a 1 through 100. Um you learn that uh item 20 through 35 are orcs on mounted orcs on wargs because of your tracking check. And like my players will actually have like their own copy of my random encounter chart, like in their book notebooks or their, their notes. And they will like start to fill it in as they learn to explore that region. They might say, Hey, let's go take out those orcs. And they go and take those orcs out. And I go cross that off of the random encounter chart. That's no longer an encounter. You guys killed that orc raiding camp and, that's not going to be a threat anymore. That's not going to be in the campaign. Your actions in the campaign have mechanically changed the campaign. Um, and uh, yeah, I like what you said there. You need to step back and watch what happens a bit. And I think that's, I think that's really, uh, really good advice. Um, clarify what makes a monster good or bad. So it's a sweet spot. Uh, number one, I think a monster needs to be a foe. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it needs to be something that can challenge the party members. There are there were some monsters in Battles of Bestiary that I think are just for jokes or for kids and kidding and laughing. I, it, it's interesting, but I mean, it's funny, but I just don't really think that uh, that is a useful thing. It's like having a feat in your core rule book that's like, I don't know, juggling or something. You're like, yes, I get that this exists, but this is a heroic adventure game. Why is this feat in the game? It shouldn't be in the game. It's silly. Um, secondly, uh, you want to have enough abilities uh, that make the, character, the creature interesting without also making it too complex to run. And what the abilities it does have should encourage and promote sort of an engaging gameplay interaction. It should also reward players' intuitiveness, and it should reward players' um paying attention. One of the things that I hate the most in the game is when like a plant creature is resistance to fire. Like if a player goes, Oh, it's a, it's a plant monster. I'm going to use fire because it's plant and it burns. Like you should, that should be rewarded, not punished. I hate gotcha abilities on monsters. Um, that really realistically, there's no way that the players could ever know that that is there. Um, just the random weaknesses or resistances that unless somebody had cheated and read the monster manual, I don't know if they even have to know if that's cheating uh, or they make this recall knowledge check. They're never going to know that this creature has 15 resistance acid. There's like no reason why this creature should have 15 resistance acid. And so somebody hits it with an acid arrow and you go, well, you did 18, but the creature has resistance acid 15. So it only takes three. And you're like, why or how or like in what way was that even possibly communicate to us i don't think that the only way that a player should know what a monster can do or is capable of doing should be on the basis of them spamming recall knowledge checks against it which by the way are more difficult if the creature is higher level than you meaning that the creatures that you really should be like need to know the most about are also the ones that you're the least likely to be able to actually learn about and do anything about so like a great example of this, like if there's a monster and it's got two big, long tentacles covered in spikes, when that creature grabs you with a tentacle and then grabs you and then starts constricting you, I think everybody get, understands that. When the creature with a big, long tentacle and you're closing in and it has reach or maybe even has attack of opportunity because you describe the tentacles as sort of waving all over the place, people go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Like maybe I didn't know that it had it, but... Now that it does have it for sure because it just used it on us, it goes, oh, yeah, of course it does. That makes total sense. When players are, like, guessing and they have no idea what a creature has or it has some weird random ability that, like, just has no – makes no possible sense, then I, I think the creature design is bad. Uh, so that that is what I mean by that, Vin. Um. <laughs> Oh, okay. We got we got another super chat. We got another tip from Dark Council so that Bob can afford walnut. Well, that's that's very nice. Um, you know, walnuts are really nice wood. Honestly, it's what we made. I, I've made several gaming vault tables out of walnut, and I really, really love it. Thank you, Dark Council. If you're trying to apologize for TPKing everybody, thank you. You're doing a good job. 
Um, all right, you get a walnut coffin now, Bob. Uh, Monster Vault Threats to the Nentir Veil is a good monster books. The enemies are personalized. I like usually literally have it sitting on my my shelf it's like usually ready to go it's like one of my most referenced books i just don't see it right now uh yeah that book is amazing uh monster uh monster vault threats to the ninter veil is one of the best monster manual books of all time and uh it's incredible and everything about it is how every monster manual book should be now i'm like legitimately like where did that book go I've been trying to reorganize my closet or my game collection. Anyways, point is, it is a really, really good book, and um, I do like it. Um, yeah, I do like some monster books. I liked, uh, I liked Monster Manual four was okay in three point five. Monster Manual five for third edition was really, really good. It was like they're in between third edition and fourth edition book. I really liked Monster Manual five for third edition monster manual four was still okay it was going in the right direction but monster manual five was a plus um i really liked uh monster manual threats to the nentir veil um i really liked the dark sun creature catalog from fourth edition D D as well uh what else did i really like are there any other books i really liked um i thought libris mortis from third edition 3.5 was also really really good uh as well and i did like battle zoo bestiary um, so let's see, uh, William Francis, I have that book. I'm assuming you're talking about the, uh, the old school Renaissance book that we were talking about before that, I, that doesn't surprise me that you have it. Any favorite old school adventures or one shots, A, D and D era preferred. Um, I think secret city is a really cool module. Um, I love running B2 keep on the borderlands. I think it's classic. I think it really, it really sells players on that. Like this is a sandbox. You can go to any cave you want. You can explore, you can leave, you can come back. You can make a deal with the ogre. You can uh, betray the orcs to the goblin tribes, to the cobalt tribes. You can avoid the undead. You can come back with a cleric and kick their ass. You can be afraid of the Minotaur. You can run from the Minotaur. Um, I think that's great. That's like AD and D from like second edition. Uh, William Brandis just said sword of the Dales. Yeah. There's a series of three adventures, uh, sword of the Dales, secret spire haunt and return of Randall Morn. I thought those were really cool. Uh, they were based in, you know, Forgotten Realms, second edition. Uh, but those were really fun modules as well. Um, let's see. For one shots. Um, hmm. Uh, the, the Hidden Shride of Tomoe Chan is really good. Uh, that's another one that I really like. I like the way that it's designed. Uh, Hidden Shride of Tomoe Chan is good. Um, I don't like In Search of the Unknown. Um, yeah, so... I, I like those ones. So if you want to go old school, I like um, I like Hidden Shrine of Tomoe Chan, and I like that one's even I think not bad for a one shot as well. And um, yeah, all right. What else we got? Uh, I hate golems in PF two E because some of their weaknesses make no sense. That is very fair. You know, it's interesting too. Like I'm a hobbyist woodworker. Okay, like I make six projects, maybe five projects a year. Okay. And I, Derek, uh, as a hobbyist woodworker, uh, you know, I know, I, I know a good deal about, you know, the woods that I'm going to be working with. I, I make sure that I understand the, you know, the, the different species have, they take finishes differently. They finish differently. Some species, uh, have a lot of pores. Uh, some species are very tight grain. Some species are very loose grain. Some species, uh, you know, to have a lot of tear out, you have to you have to be very careful when you plane them. You have to read the grain of the wood. Um, you know, some species are really hard, some species are really soft, and that might require different tooling when you're working on them. And I'm a hobbyist woodworker who only started woodworking during the pandemic, and through not that much time and effort, uh, I made sure to take some time to learn about the different wood species that I was going to be dealing with and what their Essentially, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? What are the, you know, is this good for outdoor use, indoor use? Does it have an odor? Does it not have an odor? Does it need to be 
finished and are there any issues with finishing it? Does it stain well? Does it not stain well? All these things, all right? Um, wh why is it that we assume that adventurers who are essentially prof or professional monster, monster hunters whose life is at stake, whose, whose the realm is at stake or the world is at stake, why do we assume that they know nothing about monsters at all? Like, that's so dumb. Like, think about it this way. If I was a path, like Bob, who I see is leaving. Bye, Bob. Good night, Bob. Bob and Vin love these literary RPG books, which are basically like the idea of like, it's a book written from the point of view of like a character in a world, but they like know they're in a video game. It's like a real life video game. It's really stupid, but they love it. Anyways, um, if I was an adventurer and I might I professionally, okay, my job was to go out and fight monsters. Why would I not know like, oh, Yes, devils, immune to fire, uh, resistant to electricity and poison, um, golem, or right, iron golem. You know, you have like flashcards, iron golem. You're like uh, immune to magic, but can be affected by, uh, hasted by fire. Flesh golem, uh, immune to magic, but hasted by lightning. You know, stone golem, uh, 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 immune to uh, magic, but something by something. I don't remember what stone golems are, but it's like, what? These characters are literally professional monster hunters. Like, okay, I get it. The unique rare monster that no one has ever seen before shows up and everybody's like, oh my God, what was it? Um, but like anything else that's common, even uncommon, like to me, common should mean everybody knows this. Oh, it's a common monster. It's a common troll. Everybody knows it regenerates and it's weak to fire and acid. And that's what common means. If it's uncommon, then yeah, your adventurer knows what it is. Like, why would they not know this? Like, this knowledge is possessed because clearly a character can possess it because they can make this check. But it's like, why do they not know this? Like, do we ask them to make a recall knowledge check if someone says, I'm going to tie an, an, a knot at the top of the of, of the thing and let the rope down? And you go, do you know how to tie a knot? You know, do you know how to tie a knot? And you're like, oh, of course I know how to tie a knot. Oh, you know how to tie a knot, but you don't know anything about the monsters that you're fighting, which could kill you in an instant and where this knowledge would be extremely valuable to you. Uh, I always found that to be completely stupid. Uh, Ruin Smith asks, how much was the walnut? Uh, when we made, when we made Bob's table, which is a six person gaming vault table with a full one inch thick walnut removable top and 100% walnut, uh, aprons, legs, and rails. I think we spent probably close to about $600 or $700 on the walnut. Um, devils are weak to silver. The basics. Yeah, fantasy RPGs don't make sense in any areas. I, I, this is so stupid to me. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> super super chat just to say that lit rpgs are great just so we can plug all right he paid money check out reborn apocalypse on audible a literary rpg taking you inside the exciting quest of one man's journey to beat the game and become stronger and level up and when he does oh watch out because he's gonna be awesome um So, yes. All right. I finally have reached uh, the bottom here. Um, well, yeah, my squeezing arm, you know, I, I don't, you know, you're not, you're not a part of this, but we, we have, we have discussed this nature in, in, in ad nauseum where basically um, the argument is that recall knowledge is to remember knowledge that you already have, which means that your character technically does know all of this. And they are just seeing if they can make the check in combat to see if they can remember it. But even if you researched it ahead of time, you would still not be able to use that knowledge unless you made a recall knowledge check. Because technically, your character already did know this. They're just recalling it. So if you go out of your way to basically stipulate that you're learning it again, you don't need to. You already do know everything. You're just seeing if you can remember it. So... And thank you for the subscription, Harbinger. Um, so, yeah, um, I uh, don't need to go anywhere. Um, I know it's it's getting on to uh, it's getting on here close to nine o'clock. Some people have 
fallen off. We had, we almost had a hundred people in here at one point. That's crazy. And then they got tired of hearing me rant. They wanted to see what I wanted to say. Um, but uh, if anybody has any other questions or anything like that, I am happy to uh, to ask, answer them because, uh, well, I don't have a game. I don't have a game to prepare for Tuesday, so I get like the weekend off, huh? Uh, Damien asks, "Are you ready for the final frontier on Monday?" I am. Um, I've I've read up on the rules a little bit more. Um, I think I know. I have a better grip on what I'm doing for our Star Trek Adventures game, which uh, Damien is our game master for, and we're playing it on our Patreon Discord. And uh, my uh, Lieutenant JG Adam Rilson is uh, looking forward to his next his next proper mission once he's properly assigned to the USS Odysseus. Any estimates for the start of Northern Reaches? Well, my goal is before I go on vacation, I want to get out my GM guidebook to the GMs so they can start thinking about and creating ideas for their uh, adventures. And we are going to probably buy and set up another Forge server that'll be just for Northern Reaches. And then we will get those GMs access as we kind of move into the end, the second half of March and they can start building content into the foundries. Um, and then with any luck, uh, it, 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 some of it's going to depend on the GMs, how quickly the GMs can develop. If, if GMs can develop, you know, an adventure and put some stuff up on the foundry in a couple short weeks, then we could be having our first adventures uh, as early as April. So that's where we are with Northern Reaches. What are my thoughts on the Oracle class in PF2? I don't know if you've ever answered this before. I love them for flavor and some are strong, but the curses are way too harsh. The curses are way too harsh. It, 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 the class is killed by how they, they're not powerful enough for the massive drawbacks that the curses give them. And Paizo is so afraid of people minimizing curses. Um, and so, you know, they're afraid to make the class powerful because they're afraid people will figure out a way to circumvent the penalties of the curse. And so they basically make the character like a plus one on strength and then like a minus five on curse. And it just nets nets to a very uninteresting character and a very weak one. And nine times out of ten, a divine or a cult or whatever uh, tradition sorcerer is going to just be a much, much much stronger character in almost every conceivable way. The, the flavor is really fun. Um, I really like the flavor of the life Oracle a lot, actually like a lot, a lot, but it's such a drawback and the, what you gain from it, like that Oracle spirit link is just so weak, even as a focus spell. Um, it's only once per round. It, it was very disappointing. Um, we had a, a player of ours in our game ran one and it was very underwhelming in every possible way. Um, right. You know a lot about computers, but you still brush up on your certificate exam. I mean, I've been a data scientist and a data analyst for over 15 years, and I have a huge chart, a, a huge rack of books here. Uh, I would say at least five of which I bought in the last two years because during the pandemic, I was buying books just to stay, you know, brushed up and up to date and what's going on. And, um, you know, I don't go into an, a, every time I start a new assignment, I'm not like, I don't know anything. I've, I don't know anything about this challenge or this situation or this type of analytic or model. This is all brand new to me. I have no nothing. It's like that's adventures. It's like recall knowledge is one of those tropes that's so common in D20 games where it's like they go out of their ways to figure out the way to make your character seem the most incompetent and the most useless. Like you roll nat one up, you slip on a banana peel and you fall right in front of the guards that you were trying to sneak in. It's like, come on. It's not Charlie Chaplin. It's not slapstick comedy. They do these things to make, it's like the game is already pretty, pretty ridiculous when you have feather tokens that can explode into trees, ladders, and anchors. You don't got to make it worse with characters being like, I don't know anything. Um, Like, I'll give you a great example. If your character, your player character, your group of characters, you and your party, and a um, a blue dragon descends from the sky, and the party member goes, all right, I'm going to cast resist energy electricity. Why? Why? Did you make a recall knowledge check? Do you know that blue dragons have something to do with electricity? How do you know that? And if you didn't make the recall knowledge check, you didn't recall that knowledge. It's like, right? It, it leads to a, a stupid outcome. Um, and I hate it. Um, 
What am I doing uh, Tuesday instead? One shot time off meeting about next campaign. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, I think I think we might. Uh, you know, we'll see what the group wants to do. I mean, it might just turn into another uh, QA stream because we're not going to have a Thursday live stream next week at this time because I'm going to be getting on a plane to go to Vegas. Um, I might do some YouTube live stuff from Vegas though, if people want to see that. Just you know, me having some fun, trying to get out there and enjoy myself um, in this like first real post pandemic uh vacation i guess um uh, but anyway so we we will see what we want to do a lot of this comes down to i'm not 100 percent sure what you know bob tim nick and matt want to do um you know as players um they may be chomping at the bit to start up again and make new characters they might be like damn that sucked and you know, I'm not I'm not really interested in starting in a new game or being a new player. It's like TPKs can be rough. They can really, you know, shake up a campaign. Um, I've seen more than one campaign essentially come to an end because of a, of a character death or a party wipe. And sometimes people decide that's a, a, a moment where, you know, you, you time to change things up. They may want to do a different type of game. Uh, and we may have to go back to the drawing board and start thinking about what do we use our live streams for and do we do multiple games or do we do different days of the week for different games and just try to figure out way and way to do it. Um, Anthony says he has an adventure ready. Well, that's good to know. Uh, any interest in traveler uh, like Firefly, the RPG or Kurt Russell and soldier. Well, I, I own, um, I own like a, I think I own the mongoose version of traveler, maybe a different version of traveler. I mean, I think traveler is fun. I have a weird relationship with sci-fi RPGs. Um, I'm playing in the Star Trek adventure game, as I said before, from it's a 2D20 system. And it's like the first real time I'm playing in a sci-fi RPG. And we'll see how it goes. But historically, I have not been, I'm a huge sci-fi fan, but I've never really liked role playing in it. So do I think that the non-core classes are weaker than the core classes? I think the investigator is weaker. I think the swashbuckler is weaker. I think the oracle is way weaker. I think the magus is weaker. I think the inventor might be probably okay. I think the summoner is weaker. So yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> oracle was massacred worse than the war priest with the addition change. I mean, it's hard to argue. Oracle might be one of the worst classes in the game. If you're having fun with it, keep playing it. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be optimized. I'm just saying mechanically, it's it's kind of a dead end. Oh, Gunslinger. I forgot about the Gunslinger. The Gunslinger is okay. I mean, I respect that they get the expert, you know, legendary, uh, expert to legendary proficiency. I forgot about them entirely. Um, but they are very crit dependent. And that means if you're fighting a lot of higher level monsters, uh, you're not going to crit a lot, which means you're not going to get the fatal trait, which means you're, you're going to be really under un, unimpressed with the damage output that the character is doing. And they have a gun, so you kind of expect them to do some damage output. Um, <laughs> Patty's Day next Thursday, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have some drinks um, before we get to the on the plane. You know, that's, that's pretty sweet. Don't lose all that sweet KLLC money at poker. No, the KLLC money is in a separate account. Um, uh, well, at least a separate divide account. I am forming an LLC this month, um, and that's the plan. So we're going to actually have a Knights of Last Call website, Knights of Last Call email addresses, Knights of Last Call bank account. So that is coming. Um, yeah, that's fair enough. My squeezing arm. That seems like a reasonable decision. Uh, Pathfinder 2 seemed to get away, do away with that. They got rid of the taking 10 rule. They got rid of the taking 20 rule. They turned taking 10 into a feat that you have to take, assurance, and then they made it weaker than just rolling the die. So it's like they did everything they could in this edition to try to discourage hand-waving dice rolls. Um, in fact, they try to basically say like, well, you can't just hand wave a dice roll because a critical failure, which occurs on a one, always has some sort of negative effect, like rolling a nat one on a recall knowledge check and having to lie to your players about what they actually know. Uh, a rule that I cannot stand. I cannot abide it. It's horrible. Um, do a live stream for Vegas. Let people donate for you to spin the roulette wheel. The new wheel of pain. Um Let's see. I know. No phones allowed. I know. We could go we could go live from the slot machines. I don't actually like playing slot machines. I like playing craps. Uh, I, I like a little bit of blackjack. I like craps. I like pie gal poker. I don't like slot machines, but I do my my the people I'm going with, or at least one of them, 
they spend way too much money at the slot machines and they're really funny and they have all these like funny mannerisms when they play slot machines and I do like watching them play slot machines. Um, Cortex Prime, I read once a very long time ago. I think that was the game system that they used for leverage, maybe, the leverage RPG. I think if it is, then I did read it. It is interesting. Um, the wheel of watch Derek gamble away your money. Anyway, so this isn't this is not the night to last call money. This is this is uh Derek got a bonus uh, at the end of last year from his uh, awesome company, and uh, he squirreled it away and said, oh, "I'll do something fun with this." And I thought about maybe buying a new table saw, but like I'm just not woodworking anymore really because I'm so busy with this channel now. Um, and so spending like, you know, three or four grand on a new table saw just seems a little bit silly when I'm not really even spending that much time in my wood shop. So, um, oh, I didn't even mention the witch. Yeah. Sorry. Which, which doesn't do it for me either. Yeah. Um, in fact, part of the problem is I think a lot of the secondary classes, uh, and maybe even some of the core classes, I think they should just be archetypes. And I think Pathfinder should have just like made like a system where like you get like there's like three core or four core chassis like there's like the warrior chassis and then there's like the expert chassis and then there's like the spell casting chassis and that's what you pick right from the get i am picking the warrior chassis and i am picking the spell casting chassis and i'm picking the expert chassis and that'll sort of define like the the very backbone of your character and then everything else is an archetype right like Ranger is an archetype. Uh, Barbarian is an archetype. Um, and these are all just things that you just plug into that backbone. And I would have loved that. That would have been way better. Uh, Zan, Zan coming at me with the cipher system. Yes, they did it right. And by the way, the cipher system came out a long time ago. I was looking this the other day and I was like, oh yeah, Numenera. Like I got that back in like 2018. Like, no, it came out like in like 2015 or something. It was crazy. At like 2016, it came out a long time ago, like right as 5th edition uh, D&D was first rolling out. Um, yeah, dubious knowledge is also horrible. <laughs> yes, if Vegas goes really well, well then, well, uh, you know, if I had the money, I would get a, a, my own workshop and I would just get a bunch of sweet tools. But again, I just realize that right now in my life, I'm not going to be in there. And that would just make me feel horrible all the time. Um, well, Gabriel, like it's a joke at our table. Like whenever someone rolls a one on a uh, recall knowledge check or whatever, like the GM will be like, oh, you heard that those ogres really like shrubberies. You know, like it's. We, we make fun of it because it's just so stupid. Um, uh, Zan, I could I could see where that could be true. Yeah. Um, the sustain, the cackle, I think, is the ability of the witch. Uh, the cackle is pretty good. Later, Jason. When will we see a TTRPG made by you? Oh, that's a, that's a long time. Um, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think in the coming months, we are going to try our hand with the help of some of our community members at creating some Pathfinder 2 content, uh, maybe some new feats, magical items, encounters, monsters, archetypes, uh, maybe even some mini adventures, and seeing if we can make that part of our Patreon offerings for people uh, to sort of encourage people to get, join the community and be part of it. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think uh, I think after that, I think we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, Jason says he's working. Oh, he had to leave, but he's working on a classless Pathfinder variant that's kind of like that. Well, that's very interesting because you and I are kind of thinking the same things. Um, I do like the idea of backgrounds archetype. In fact, I actually argue that if you're using the free archetype variant, I feel like the background component is the. Choosing the background is the least interesting part of building a character in Pathfinder 2. Like, you, the, the stat assignments are kind of silly and stupid anyways. I think you should just be able to pick two stats. It doesn't even matter. The skill feat that it gives you is always questionable. Um, and a lot of times you end up with a lore feat that's really silly and stupid. And I get that it adds some depth to your character, but I don't really see it. I think it's kind of silly. I think if your game is focused on heroic fantasy, that stuff doesn't matter. And if it's not focused on heroic fantasy, then it doesn't do nearly enough. 
Do you know Paleomythic by Osprey Games? Uh, I do not know Paleomythic. You're throwing a bunch of games out at me, Marcos. I do not know. Um, so check out Hyperborea. Hyperbia? Hyperbia. Uh, making wooden minis. Oh, my God. Uh, so, yeah. When will we see a TTRPG? KOTC? Uh, we'll see. Like I said, we'll see how the content creation goes. Uh, you know, there's uh, something I read on Reddit. I think I'm a member of it. It's like r slash RPG design. Just a bunch of people who publish RPGs. And they said some principle of paradigm, which I thought I was I thought was pretty good. They're like, RPGs have been being made for like 50 years now, and they've really blown up in the last 20, especially with independent and small press publishing. If if you haven't seen a mechanic yet, and you, you know, and you're pretty aware of of other games like I am. If you haven't seen a mechanic yet, it's not because no one ever tried it. It's because a bunch of people did try it and it didn't work. It, and it failed their playtesting. Um, and so there's a certain there's a certain idea within the RPG design space that we may have sort of, you know, there's only so many ways you can roll a D10, or there's only so many ways you can roll a D20. Oh, we're rolling D20 under, we're running D20 over, oh, we're rolling 2D20 and taking the lowest one. And, you know, there's only so many ways that you can skin a cat. And, um, you know, I think I, I could understand that. I could see part of that. In fact, I think that's part of the reason why Genesis system does what it does, why the Legend of the Five Rings game does what it does, where they had this idea of these custom dice, because that does allow you to change the math up. But that also creates its own set of the problems. People find that the all these bonus dice are very fiddly. It's an extra expense. It's an extra cost. It's a whole other thing that you have to learn. It can be very, very prone to analysis paralysis, and it could take a long time to process a Genesis dice roll or a Legend of the Five Rings dice roll. So everything, you know, there's no the, there's no free lunch. Everything is, you know, for free. Hyperborea, okay. Yeah, Cones of Dunshire, the RPG. That's right. Um, and, uh, you know, to be to be clear, Lance... My number one concern, if I wrote an RPG, would be that I would overdo it and make it too complicated, and I would try to come up with a rule for every little cool niche, new nuance thing, and I would end up with, like, Cones of Dunshire, the RPG. So that is very true. Uh, <laughs> the, rare, the rare backgrounds are pretty dope. Yeah, I mean, the rare backgrounds are pretty dope, but, I mean, they're obviously very, they're supposed to be very unique and individualistic, so. Um... Well, that's very cool. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I think it's interesting to see what uh, what we can come up with, and I mean, I I clearly have ideas. I mean, there, I I have been searching in my personal life for sort of the holy grail of RPGs for a very long time. Like, what is the game that is perfect for me? Um, that is a balance between the excitement and fun and fantasy adventuring. Um, of, of Dungeons and Dragons and other fantasy RPG systems, while at the same time mechanically integrating role-playing in a fascinating and compelling and interesting way. Um, and that's kind of like Legend of the Five Rings RPG does this really, really well. Now, it is very specific, hyper-focused as being a fantasy medieval Japan Bushido simulator. So it's not applicable in a wide range of situations, but um, that game does it pretty well. And in terms of like old school sort of gritty survival elements, um, I've really been loving um, the, uh, the forbidden lands game as well. So like, those two game systems right now, I've I've been intrigued what I've seen by the two, 2D20 game systems. Uh, I've been playing the Star Trek Adventure game. I just ordered the Dune game because I love Dune, period. I, I would just read that book just because I love Dune. Um, so I ordered the Dune Adventures in the Imperium game, and I think I ordered the Conan game as well, the 2D20 games from Ophidius. I, I'm interested in what that system does. I like some of the things that it's doing. I really like... I mean, I like, I like a lot of stuff that Free League is putting out, quite frankly. I didn't really like, um, what's it called? Uh, the Game in the Dark Woods. I didn't like that one as much. But, like, I really like Forbidden Lands. Um, this one has been uh, really, really interesting to me. I like what they're doing with the charts and the tables. and the. It's a very interesting gameplay. Um, some of the stuff with the Free League game, or I should call it the Year Zero engine, with willpower is a little fiddly. And I don't know if I love every element about that willpower component, but it does do some stuff I like. So I like Legend of the Five Rings slash fifth edition slash Genesis in that kind of Symbarum. Thank you, Akimos. It's Symbarum. That's the one. I, I own that one. 
eh, I, I wasn't as big on that. But um, when I finally get the RPG Marvel, I, I do like superhero RPGs, but historically have not liked the IP dependent superhero RPGs. But of course, I'd be willing to try it. I think it's really awesome. Well, that sounds awesome because I love 3.5 D and I'm okay on fifth edition D and D. It's not. I don't think it's. I don't think it's bad. I was just so disappointed with it. But anyways, I like 3.5 of D&D. I like PF2E. I love Mutants and Masterminds. Love Mutants and Masterminds. I have like, I have a two whole th- cubes back there full of Mutants and Masterminds from Mutants and Masterminds 1st Edition. Mutants and Masterminds 2nd Edition. I have like four PHBs from uh, core rule books from Mutants and Masterminds 2nd Edition. Mutants and Masterminds 3rd Edition. I have Ultimate Power. I have all the Power Books, all the Splat Books, Silver Age, Golden Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, uh, Modern Age, uh, all this stuff. I love Mutants and Masterminds. Um... Uh, with this TPK, how would you overall rate PF2E? Zan, it's hard for me to judge because, as we said at the beginning of this stream, we really haven't been playing Pathfinder 2E. Uh, even when I was using my hero points, it was very, very modified and different. That being said, it does still count. And I have played other Pathfinder 2 games. I'm being a player in it. Right now, I would rate Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Let's see. Like a 7 out of 10. You know, I, again, I'm a very harsh critic. Uh, I mean, it's better than average. Um, there's a lot that the game is doing right. And if you are playing in that wheelhouse, if you are, if you want a very combat heavy RPG with a lot of mechanical choices, and don't mind having to really dig into the rules, um, then Pathfinder 2E is a fantastic choice. If, uh, you know, for the, for the fifth edition player who really likes getting you know nitty gritty and mechanical with their builds, but feels super limited by the the, the lack of options, Pathfinder 2E is a great and and likes getting into combat and taking initiatives and turn based initiative and turn based combats and turn based rounds. It, it is a, it, probably the best game on the market. Where does it get dings from me? Um, I think it is overly cumbersome at times. I think it is, the math is n- perhaps too tight um, and and needlessly restrictive. I think a lot of the options uh, and spells and feats and classes, all the options are, are needlessly restrictive and punitive and punishing in order to sort of curtail this imaginary power gamer at some convention somewhere or somebody's table that you know is powerless the gm is powerless to stop the player from choosing some broken or busted combination uh some of the editing and des- and choices of how some of the books and some, especially some of the monster books are laid out is suspect and questionable at best i appreciate what they try to do with the trait system but i think it creates more problems than it solves those are like my high level dings have I seen Lasers and Feelings one page RPG? Of course I have. I've played Lasers and Feelings several times at various uh, conventions as one shots, and it is uh, it is fun. It's interesting. Um, do you have suggestions for a game that is like PF2E but has less bloat? Fourth edition D and D, but it, there is a lot of bloat there too, I guess. So. No, <laughs> I don't know. No, not really. Uh, but I mean, 4E, uh, 4E D&D is, I think, the closest super hyper tactical fantasy RPG system. I might even argue that 4E D&D is maybe more balanced, but not as tightly controlled. But, you know, there are a lot of splat books that came up for that edition as well. Going on year three, do you think Pathfinder 2 is starting to become bloated like Pathfinder 1 is? No. And I think they're doing this deliberately because right now, uh, because feats are tied to a class and they haven't really released that many skill feats or general feats. Like if I have a new class comes out, the only thing I have to do is look up that class. That book, that Dark Archives book or that APG book, I mean, or APG was the exception, but like uh, Guns and Gears and stuff like that doesn't have all these feats for your fighter. So, like, if Guns and Gears and Dark Archive and, you know, uh, Secrets of Magic, if all these books had feats for the core classes in the CRB, then I would be concerned because that's where you get this issue where you're like, I want to make a fighter. And you're like, okay, I need 17 books. Right now, today, if you want to make a character class, you basically just need the book that that character class is in and the core rule book and maybe the advanced player's guide because they did put 
some extra feats in the advanced player guide. So, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Would you have uh, would you have consideration for running PF two again, but without gimmicks like the Wheel of Pain? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, the Wheel of Pain was a fun experience, you know, delinquent, and um, you know, uh, I think that it, it did get out of control, and I think it got, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, kind of maybe purposely abused. I, I think. You know, and, and and not in a super vindictive way, but in a way that I think the the player base or you know the the audience members that wanted to see it, I think they wanted to see, hey, will this will this go all the way? And it did. But ultimately, um, almost with any campaign I do, that it, once I do something, it's interesting. I don't want to do it again. You know, I'm not the kind of person who like finishes a video game and then plays it back again like immediately. Like, no. Would I ever revisit something like that? Sure. Maybe for a charity stream or maybe for like a, a, a one-off fun romp, you know, or maybe even like a like a three-shot, you know, like we're playing this legendary adventure. Like if we were doing Tomb of Horrors, would I want to bring back something like the Wheel of Pain? Yeah, of course. That would be awesome. That would be hilarious. But um, but would I consider running PF2 again? I mean, we are going to run PF2 again. It's just a question of in what form and, and how are we going to do it, um, you know. And, and what elements do we, I do want to still put elements in the game that is going to make it uniquely my game, but I probably have a much, much, much lighter touch, uh, than we did last time. So, and, um, so yeah, so, you know, stay tuned, stick with it. Um, hopefully you'll see some, uh, future content, uh, in the future that, uh, you know, that you will enjoy. Uh, Eminem is your default favorite by now and, uh, constantly looking at new ones. Uh, except extended, I wouldn't give those people my money. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, like, for example, I and mean, we're dealing with this Bob. Bob's new to the game. Like, look, it's 2022, people, okay? We don't need... I can't even... T we were playing in the game, and Bob is playing, like, a spellcaster for, like, the first time. And, like, he got, like, a third level wand <clears throat> from, from Aaron, from our GM. And after the game, he goes... Uh, what does this mean? I go, well, what, what is it? He goes, it's a third level one. And I go, well, that could mean a lot of things. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I go, well, it could be a third level one, meaning it's capable of casting a third level spell. Or it could be an item level three wand, in which case it would be capable of casting a first level spell. And it could also be a level three three caster level wand in which case it would be casting a level two spell but its item level i think would be five and bob's head just like exploded and rightfully so like you know we're we're it's 2022 like just make level six spells you get them at level six level 10 spells you get them at level 10 level 15 spells you get them at level 15 just do that this, this is such a needless dumb sacred cow like even to the point where with their in-cap rules, when you're using a spell thing, because it's tied to level, you have to do this stupid thing where you have to double the level of the spell anyways to compare it to the creature's actual level to determine if the in-cap applies or not. So you're already, they're making you do that calculation because they understand that it's stupid that it's not in the game. Anyways. Uh, only a 7 out of 10. Any systems you played higher on this metaphysical rating? Yes. But with, a, with an asterisk, Right. The asterisk being that these are very niche games that are not for everyone. I think if you are interested in extreme samurai Bushido drama with very uh, mechanical narrative gameplay, then Legend of the Five Rings 5th Edition... Legend of the Five Rings 5th Edition is, is like a 9 out of 10. Um, and I think what this game is doing is brilliant. But it anything if you're using that for anything else, it's like a two out of ten or a one out of ten. Uh, if you want to do, if you want to do very um, uh, open ended exploratory teenage supernatural queer romance, Monster Hearts is hands down the best game system ever designed. It's a ten out of ten. Um, but if you're not interested in that genre, 
it is it is a failure. So you know what where I give PF two the, the respect is um, it it's pretty it's a broad genre. Now is it as see this is the problem is PF two a game system for everybody? No, and and what I don't like about Pathfinder two and what I don't like about fifth edition either is they. They paint, they market themselves as this, like, well, you can be, you can use this system for anything. No, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I, I, I it pains me to see people playing games in these systems. And, and I'm like, these systems are so bad at playing these, these type of games that you want to play. I mean, use your time however you want. I'm not personally attacking you or nor am I not going to tell you to not play, but I would highly encourage you. I would highly recommend. I think you could be much more, uh, enjoy your time much more greatly if you did something else. And the only respectful thing that I will say is when people say, well, I don't have time to learn a different system and or the only games that people will play is fifth edition. Those are real concerns and I don't, I don't discredit those. So, um, let's see. Star Wars Saga is pretty good. I agree with that. Uh, I don't know if it's the closest to design space there, Damien. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I think the issue with squeezing arm about PF2 is you do have to be really worried about the balance. Because the math is so tight, it's like a it's like a knife edge that's really, really hard, which means it can be really, really sharp, but it can also mean that it's really, really brittle and prone to breaking. And because the game's rules are so, the math is so tight, like it could be very easy to go too far and make something that is really actually quite busted. I mean, No Nat wasn't wrong when he made his video I mean, we've all known this for a long time, but, you know, the fighter kind of causes a lot of problems in the design space of Pathfinder 2nd Edition just because of how stupidly powerful being plus two better is to anything else. Um, uh, I'm, Robert, I, I appreciate you saying that, uh, you know, that the Wheel of Pain isn't a bad thing. It generates income for them, which is great. It is. It's awesome. The money has been incredible. It's going to make a big difference to the channel. Um, it's going to go a long way towards paying back people their investments when we first started this channel. So you know the the the, the money that people put into the game to to influence it and be entertained and yeah, it, it all got crazy and wonky and sideways. But I'm not going to lie, like it was a huge financial win for us, and I think it also created some pretty unique and interesting moments. And I understand that some audience members feel bad. I understand that some players in my group feel bad. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't discredit anybody for feeling like that. Uh, you don't have to be tipped by a wheel of pain to feel upset by a TPK. I think there's two ways you could go with it. You could either be more upset that it was caused by the wheel of pain, or you could be less upset. I think some of my players were less upset. I think some audience members were less upset than if it had just happened uh, ordinarily through just bad luck. Uh, and I think some players were more upset, and I think some audience members were more upset too. I do agree that the implementation needs work. I don't know that in its current form that we'll, we'll, we will see it as such, but... That is the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, yes, if we are playing Pony Finder, there will be the most harshest wheel of pain that you could ever possibly imagine. The spins will start at $1. Do you like the dice pool mechanic, like Warhammer 3rd and Star Wars? Yes, I do. Uh, Legend of the Five Rings uses a dice pool mechanic. I am a big fan of dice pool post-roll interpretation. Um, we are never playing Fatal, ever. Uh, we're never playing Fatal. Uh, that game should be deleted. That is true, Christopher. Fourth edition cannot get any more bloated. It is, it is, uh, it is, it is completely done. But yeah, I, I do like dice pool mechanics a lot. And I, I've really been interested in dice pool mechanics for a very long time. Um, ever since I played Warhammer Fantasy 3rd edition, which is where they first, inter where Fantasy Flight Games basically rolled out Genesis that turned into, you know, Star Wars. And they used a variant of it for L5R. Um, but I really like rolling first, then making decisions. And Legend of the Five Rings is even better than that, than Genesis, which is another reason why I really like the rolling system. Um, <laughs> yeah, Zan, I, I, look, uh, you know, I, I there's pros and cons. If we do an AP, people tend to get excited about that because it's like, oh, it's like official content. And I was maybe thinking about playing that AP or I did play that AP. And it's cool to see other people doing their own thing. Doing a homebrew can be really interesting, but I also find that unless you're like like Critical Role or Glass Cannon Podcast, it can be really difficult to get audience buy-in. And quite frankly, it's a lot more work 
for us. Uh, it's certainly more work for the GM. And uh, again, if the if the profitability isn't there, I'm like, well, those are that's those are hours that I'm spending on this campaign that I'm not spending doing combat and tactics videos or night school videos or other additional line screams. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, L5R also has great foundry integration. So I have L5R currently installed on the Patreon's Forge server as a game system. I have played around with it. The dice pool mechanic in it is awesome. The dice roller. I, it does suck that there's like nothing in any of the compendiums because I don't think fantasy flight games has given them permission. There's no like OGL for fantasy flight games. So if you want to put something in, you do have to type all that stuff in, you know, uh, <laughs> the three action economy lets you use three actions around, but some actions can only take two actions. So you can use one action and take an action that only uses one action. That is hundred percent correct. That is exactly it oh we got a super chat zan coming through with the uh cypher system a one-shot campaign when um you know I, I yeah i don't know maybe that is something too that we can figure out is there a way i i love a lot of these rpg systems i've played a lot of these rpg systems i've read them all and even some of my players like bob are really interested in all these different rpg systems because he wants to sort of experience the cornucopia, the full buffet. And some of my patrons and some of our audience members are also very interested in that as well too. So maybe there is a way that we can figure out a way to regularly bring these sort of, uh, you know, one-offs or I, I call them multi-shots where it's like three to five sessions of, uh, of a game system so that you can really uh, get to experience it and chew into it a little bit. Um. My buddy told me about an extremely curious system uh, called Shadow of the Demon Lord, and he said to look at the spell list and who boy. It's a brilliantly designed system. The brilliant Robert Schwalb designed that system. Uh, it is fantastic. It's my favorite implementation of the 5E. It's kind of it it's not it's not D&D &D 5th edition, but it's very strongly D&D &D 5th edition esque adjacent, and it is a fantastic game system. Uh, I really like that. The theme is kind of hard baked into the game. So if you don't want that sort of like post-apocalyptic death world, Orcus rules undead is evil everywhere. It kind of, you kind of lose something about it. It is pretty hard baked in the system, but the, the way that they use the dice, uh, the way that they've interpreted advantage into the Banes and Boon system. Um, I love the way that they do the three tiers of classes, like the initiate, Maybe it's, I don't know, it's like initiate, paragon, expert, master classes or something. I, I I really am a big fan of the way that Rob Schwal designed that game. So I do like Shadow of the Demon Lord a lot. It's not 100% my cup of tea in terms of flavor, which is pretty baked into the game system. Kind of like Legend of the Five Rings has Bushido Fantasy Samurai baked pretty much into the game system. But there are a lot of good nuggets in there. You got called toxic for saying 5e is an ideal system for Doctor Who. 5e is not an ideal system for Doctor Who. Um, yeah. Oh, played it prone to character death. It is. It is a gritty game system. There is no doubt about that. Um, <laughs> you, you hate how easy 5e for me, 5e is just, um, you know, it's cheese pizza, man. Like it's fine. It, it'll, it fills me up. It's, it's not bad, but I'm literally going to choose almost anything else every time. I won't say no to it. I'm not going to tell you that cheese pizza is gross or that it's bad or that it's disgusting. It's just, Cheese pizza. And quite frankly, I'm, again, almost 40 years old. I've had a lot of cheese pizza in my life, and I'm okay not having just cheese pizza ever again. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways we could explore it. I mean, at the end of the day, some of the, the worst of the worst of the Wheel of Pain were so bad that, you know, I do think that they it was pretty needlessly punitive but i mean i think part of the idea was oh my god this horrible horrible thing happened and the party has five or six hero points so it is going to be insane when they you know beat their way out of it and if they aren't able to beat their way out of it what a heroic and epic conclusion and ending and i think the whole idea was it was was the wheel of pain designed to kill the party yeah but whether they died or lived, I think it was designed to make it this exciting and thrilling end. Whether they get out of it or whether it, it's a it's a this brutal kind of hero, you know, Boromir arrow to the chest, arrow to the chest. 
arrow to the chest, you know, I would have gone with you, my king, my, you know, my, my captain, my king, to the end. Like, it was supposed to generate these incredibly crazy, awesome, over-the-top moments. And, you know, it arguably did, but not in, like, maybe the complete epic way that I wanted to because it was so lopsided at the very end. Um, so, there we go. Uh, okay, Nolan Inquisitor, this is the Shadow Demon Lord. This is a novice expert in Master Paths. It's a brilliant game design. It's only, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nolan Inquisitor, I think the game only goes to 10th level. I'm a big fan of D20 fantasy-based games that only go to 10th level. Uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord does it. 13th Age does it. Oh, 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 someone who said you want to look at a Pathfinder 2 game that isn't like Pathfinder 2 but isn't like 4th edition, everybody go buy 13th Age right now. Go buy it. It was designed by Jonathan Tweet, who designed 3rd edition D&D, and it was designed by Rob Heinso, who designed 4th edition D&D. They got together and they created 13th Age. It is an awesome mix of sort of uh, really mechanical, tactical, crunchy gameplay, along with like these crazy, um, cool indie RPG elements. Uh, I think it's really, really fun. I think there's a lot to learn from it, and I think it's really crazy, and you should check out 13th Age. Um... Would you ever consider converting older content 3.5 or older or 5e content to 5e? To, yeah, oh yeah. I would love to run like Red Hand of Doom, uh, Total Entropy. Uh, again, I love that module and I think it would be really, really fun. And it's, you know, it, it doesn't get too high level, so it's not crazy. And I think Red Hand of Doom could be really, really fun in um, uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So that is one module that I have definitely had my eye on for a while. Um, it's a fun module. Uh, I want to run, I want Derek to run an alpha so I can put my unicorn concept. You know, I, I think it's a cool concept. I like the unicorn clan. Uh, hey, total entropy. Thanks. And go vote monster hearts on the Patreon. Oh, oh that would be, I mean, that would be really funny to see those guys playing monster hearts. <laughs> oh, that would be so funny. Um, oh, Ben is here. Hey, welcome, Ben. Um, there are a lot of PF1 APs that could benefit from the last conversions. You guys would do a great job with the Mummy's Mask or Ruins of Aslan. Yeah, I mean, I would love to, you know, take a look at some of those. I know that there are people out there who are trying to do those conversions. Certainly, one of the things that I did, even in Rise of the Rune Lords, is I dropped, I got rid of quite a few number of encounters because Rise of the Rune Lords and those early APs are really padded with a lot of extra fights just so that they could, quote, get the XP totals up. And ugh, it could be a horrible slog if you play them as written, so... Don't, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your players. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Delta, you know, Call of Cthulhu is probably like the number one or number two most popular uh, after Pathfinder Second Edition like system on our on our Patreon Discord. And um, you know, I, I years ago I never had any interest in Call of Cthulhu, but the first book that I ever bought was actually Delta Green because I really loved X Files growing up, and I thought Delta Green seemed really cool. I never actually got to play it, but I did buy it, and I thought it was really cool. Um, yeah, the Dark Council, and he just showed up. Oh man, this is this is mysterious. The Dark Council has it's like the Illuminati. They have they have fingers and and they have uh, they have their tendrils into everything. Um, 5e is okay, but I don't think I would play it over other systems to give the choice. And that's how I feel. If I showed up at someone's house and they were, you know, they were excited to like, hey, we're gonna play some role playing games. I'm like, cool. And they're like, we pull out fifth edition. It would be like, it would be like somebody playing. If I went over to someone's house and we were gonna have like board games and they had like hors d'oeuvres and they had ordered pizza and it was, you know, they had two liters of soda and some solo cups and, a, you know, a case of beer in the fridge and someone pulled out ticket to ride. Okay. Uh, I'm never going to pick Ticket to Ride to play, okay? I I played it. I don't... It's fine. Whatever. It's pastime. You know, if somebody pulled out Clue or Monopoly, I'm not going to say no, but, like, I'm not excited to play it, and it wouldn't be the choice that I would pull off the shelf. Um, pizza is amazing. Sometimes it's Lenten. You can only eat cheese pizza on Friday. That is true. And that's, that's like, people who go, hey, I play fifth... I want to play role-playing games, but literally everyone I know... And everyone on the internet only plays fifth edition. That's like, that's like being that's the the Catholic equivalent of of, of Lent cheese pizza on a Friday. Um, e six, let's go, Ben. You, 
We'll have to tell. We'll have to tell. Not today, but we'll tell the story of our E6 game some other time. Lead us to say. I'll leave you with a spoiler. Our E6 game may or may not have ended with one character taking on, I think, three Baylors simultaneously. Um, <laughs> uh, I still love that he encouraging everybody to go vote Monster Hearts. That's really funny. Um, Corey says, tune down the wheel. Give it a spin when everyone's gotten two hero points. It's not a bad idea, right? That way it's always balanced out. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, do you need any help with the email website, etc.? I can help set stuff up for free if needed. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not actually in charge of that right now, so uh, I would let you know. But um, you know, uh, send me a PM on Discord. Um, I'm sure. Uh, you know, in terms of setting it up, we're a fairly technical bunch. But in terms of like website design and stuff like that, I don't know if we're going to go with WordPress or something like that. But uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've done an HTML design. I I typically, you know, I don't like to you know ask for things for free. I like to pay people for their time and their money and uh, you know, help out the economy where I can. So I don't feel like you owe us anything or need anything, but you know, but that is a very generous offer and I appreciate that. So send me a, a PM on um, discord. I cringe at the idea of KOLC monster hearts law. And so do I, or it could be the greatest thing ever. Like that might be the thing that like cracks the nut. You know, that like cracks the nut of like them getting it, like them really understanding oh, like, oh, 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 this is role play. This is what you meant all those times when you said role play, like this is it, like not smash with hammer, but like feel some sort of emotion that is different from the way I think and feel uh, what is happening i'm i'm having all sorts of strange thoughts and i feel like i'm growing as a person and as an individual it would be you know it could be it could be the, or it could just be an unmitigated disaster so uh that would be that would be pretty good uh and what if they pull out candy line pass I will pass um, unless it's some sort of drinking game candy land. But again, it takes me like two days now to recover from a hangover. So I'm even kind of soft on that. So Bob and Aaron always make fun of me because whenever they're pulling out their gigantic cauldrons of whiskey and stuff like that, um, I'll, I'll just get like a, a shot of whiskey heavy on the rocks um, and I'll sip it for like two hours because I just can't handle it anymore. Um, let's see. <laughs> Oof, WordPress, I'm judging you. I'm sorry. I don't know. Listen, I, I designed my original HTML web pages back in the 90s, like in Notepad, in, and then, you know, put them on my my Prodigy account or my my dial-up ISP. But since then, I don't I really haven't designed too many web pages. Um everyone's shitting on all right, everyone's shitting on WordPress. I'm sorry, I take it back, okay? Django or something, or whatever the hell they call it then. Yeah. <laughs> Brandis says he's not in charge of the tech. Don't worry. Um, uh, oh, you're not on the Discord. Oh, yeah, oh, you're not on Patreon. Um, well, you should be, my squeezing arm. Um, I don't know. Let me think. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, my Discord ID. I can give you my Discord ID. Right? I can do that. I don't know how to do that. Do I know how to do that? Here to hold here. Here we go. Coming in. Coming in hot. All right. That's my Discord ID. So you can send me a you can send me a PM that way. Um all right. But again, uh, you know, appreciate your help. I, I again I'm not in charge of the tech there, but you know, uh, you know, if it's something that uh, you know, you, you got the credentials to help us out with, you know, and you're willing to help and uh we we definitely at least consider that uh oh my god self-realization and personal growth are the hallmarks of this hobby for me and they, yeah and they, and they are for me you know when i was a kid i used to play you know and it was about like i don't know killing stuff and taking loot and you know and i think that's true it's not a kid thing i think it's just a new to the hobby thing you know i look at bob and i look at um you know i look at bob and i look at nick and i, I see what they're going through and i go oh okay yeah that was me when i was 15 years old and playing you know rpgs for the first time and you do that for a good 10 years or so and then you go 
okay, maybe there's more to this hobby than, uh, than there, that is. Now, at the same time, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be rolling dice. And I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be tackling dangerous and scary situations. That's what makes the game interesting. I think sitting around and just talking in character for two hours or three hours is also hopefully painfully and pointlessly boring. So um, I like rolling dice and taking the direction that they are telling us in a, in, in a way that is innovative and creative and new and exciting and dramatic and, you know, always spiraling towards excitement and putting these characters into these pressure cookers, um, you know, that you, you personally would never want to be in and would hope to God that you would never have to be in those kind of difficult situations. But, oh, it is 10 o'clock. It, it's critical role. Uh, hey, Zan. Thanks, man. That's awesome. Well, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I hope you find it a very rewarding experience. Um, there's a lot of stuff to go over there. Um, as a knight, uh, you know, Squire is our lowest, uh, but, you know, they, that just gets you in the Discord. But the knight level gets you access to all of our exclusive content, um, which you'll find the links for in the Patreon page. Um, you know, all the videos that we've released that are only released to our patrons. Um, we do a monthly Q and a, we have monthly giveaway contests where you can win RPG products. We have a year end gift. We're even doing a giveaway at the end of the year where I'm going to custom make somebody a gaming table, uh, of their choice designed perfectly customized for them. I'm talking like, you know, handcrafted hardwood, wormwood, but even more custom, not made in a factory. And then we're going to hand deliver it to somebody. Assuming you live in the continental U.S., um, so and that's just the fringe benefits. Not to mention, um, we have community games. We have a fully kitted out Forge server with like five Foundry licenses. So we have like eight to nine community run games a week, and we have 137 extremely experienced GMs and players who are all very motivated and very passionate, and uh, you know. It's a, it's a good experience. It's a good, it's a good fun time. So hopefully I, I, I appreciate your vote of confidence and I hope you find it to be a rewarding experience. Um, <laughs> that's true. London wrote, London wrote a, a short story called the last call to sort of memorialize the final moments of the Knights of last call. You guys, <laughs> you guys think there'll be a TPK on CR tonight? What if, and just go with me on this. Okay. Um, go with me on this one here. What is, uh, we're, we're going to do over under, okay? Uh, let's say, I'm going to pick a number here. 50,000, is that number too low? Okay, 50,000, okay? All right, here we go. So here's my question. If Critical Role introduced a wheel of pain, but it was like, you know, $5,000 or something crazy, right? Like for the, for a spin. What what would be would, would they <laughs> would they make over or under $100,000 in one night on on people sp Voting to spin the wheel of pain or, or is the critical role base, um, you know, so pro critical role that they wouldn't even get close, uh, to it. Or would everybody in the channel just chat finally be like, screw it. I want to, I, I want these freaking characters to freaking die. I want to see them get, you know, I want to see them killed. And would they like go crazy on the wheel of pain? <laughs> this patron alone would fund 50k just ourselves uh, akimo says they'd make millions um uh cory says they've played everything 
uh, and love the idea of watching the Ice do three to five episodes to try some different systems and me by proxy. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a cool idea, Corey. I, I definitely want to float that idea by and, you know, see what we're doing. Um, yeah, Marcos, I like the unknown. I like the improv. I love that unknown collaborative storytelling that can happen in role-playing games. I hate... Again, we I, we talked about this on the Discord yesterday. It's the reason why I don't like modern video games. When people go, the game was okay, but I really like the story. I hate that. I that I don't really like the story of anything. I like the story that I make, the story that I am creating. And I really like the story that me and my friends are created together that no one really can point to it and say that was mine. We just say it's ours. You know, that's what I really like. Um, <laughs> you're part of the history of your hobby. Yes, yes. Um, uh, right, exactly, Anthony. Is it is it is it real fans or like is there secretly a burning desire for just like everybody just to die? You know, uh, Timothy, that's a very good point. Now, at the same time, you are playing in a role playing game, so arguably you could argue that death doesn't even matter, right? There's always MacGuffins, and players can make new characters, and if only a couple of people die, you can go get raised dead and resurrected. So one could argue that. Death is actually relatively meaningless in role-playing games in any case. Um, I, I I agree with that total entropy. I do feel it is a sitcom. It very much is, is a sitcom. I was never like a big, I was never like a big bang theory. I don't really watch TV. But like when the show first came on, I don't even have, I haven't had a TV or cable for a long time. I don't even have a TV, um, believe it or not. Um, and... Uh, when uh, but the Big Bang Theory first started, though, I still had cable. And I remember watching it being like, okay, there is a lot of really funny inside jokes in this thing. And they do are really tackling a lot of really strong elements of nerd and geek culture. And these characters are obviously a little bit insane and extreme. But for the most part, I thought it was okay. And then I came back like three or four seasons later, and they had become just total character caricatures of themselves. And I thought it was horrible and awful. So I never watched it again. But then when I did see random snippets of it throughout the later years, I was like, oh, this is this is just a sh sitcom now. This has nothing to do with nerd culture. This is a, I, Critical Role to me has nothing to do with an RPG. It is it is essentially a, a sitcom. All right, we're ending the poll. And no surprises here. Everybody says it would be uh it would be way, it would be way over. Okay, well, all right, yep. I mean that seems to make sense. Um <laughs> they hate character death, but they also love to send all their I mean that's a really interesting story. Let's let's pretend for a moment that let's pretend for a moment that there is zero fudging that happens on the critical role set. Let's pretend that um, Matt Mercer plays the game completely straight, that all the dice rolls are 100% legit. And he creates an encounter, which isn't, uh, there's no mistake or flaw, but it's a tough encounter. And, you know, you're, this isn't the end. They're not fighting Vecna. This isn't some, it's just like one of those kind of sort of, it's a, you know, critical role doesn't really have random fights, but it's like just some middle, middle of the road fight halfway or two thirds of the way through the campaign. Is there ever a chance that they TPK? And, and, and if they did, let's pretend it, the answer is no, but let's say that he was doing that and they did. And they did TPK. What, what would the audience reaction even be to that? Like, I, I can't even fathom it, you know? I think people would lose their minds. That's what I think would happen. Um, I, I think they would be like, oh, this was, I just, I'm just imagining the Twitch stream. This is all dream, right? This is just a dream sequence, right? Like, oh my God, the, the, clearly someone's having a bad dream. Is this an illusion? Is someone having a prophecy of the future? Is what? I mean, people would be, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Tim, Timothy, Timothy and I are on the same, we're on the same wavelength. You all wake up from a dream. Um, And I just, you know, I'm just imagining Mercer, you know, like the way I did on Tuesday, just closing it and being like, well, as darkness falls across Xandria, a wind whispers, and you think for a moment that it echoes the name of the great lost champions, and the people of Xandria can only look to the future with hope and dread.
we'll see you next time on Critical Role. And then it just fades to black. And like they would just, uh, ah! like people would just lose <laughs> lose their minds. Um, I, I come outside, I've not been watching. So it already happened with the Lorenzo fight. They lost the character and then the bad guy let them off as a warning. Interesting. But wasn't that also preordained? I don't know. I feel like that is. You know, Kieran, this is a problem. I talked about this uh, on the on the Patreon Q and A. I said like, um, it's even a problem in your your local game. You know, you roll up a new campaign. You're like, hey, my players are really excited. And someone's like, yeah, cool. And they show up the next week, and they've got a brand new forty dollar uh, Hero Forge mini, and they bought a brand new set of like gemstone dice from Wormwood or something. And you know, they've invested a hundred dollars into their level one character, and you're kind of like. Uh, I hope you don't die, right? Like it puts you in a really weird spot as a GM to deal with that. And I don't, I, I dare I even say like, don't do that. Like that's just, like, I'm, as like a GM, I'm be like, these things are illegal. <laughs> I'm talking about Bob right now. Uh, um, yeah, but yeah, it's like, um, you know, as someone sent me, someone sent me a message and they were like, you know, they're like, was that TPK? Like, were you planning on that or something like that? And I was like, I don't even know how you could possibly think that I go, I hope not. Then I'm really stupid because literally last week I went into Paizo, like opened up their vault or something and they are selling, uh, from back from the early two thousands, they are selling a complete set of their original rise of the rune Lords uh, battle box, the mini line, the miniature line. There's like 140. I don't remember how many there are. There's like a, you know, a bunch of minis, but they were from the rise of the rune Lords adventure path. So you have like the miniature for the skin saw man. You have the miniature for Alder and Fox glove. And you have the miniature for the scribbler or, or, you know, for Karzoog even. And I was like, Oh, that would be awesome. And eventually I hope to get back to being live in person at the studio with real miniatures and we'll be in person with each other. And so I bought this and it was like $180 or something. It was like $30 shipping. And I bought this miniature set uh, just like last week or like maybe like a week and a half ago. And it's, it, it takes like 18 days to ship because everything's crazy right now. And it's not like it's Amazon prime or something. It's coming from Paizo. Um, oh yeah, Anthony, I bought it. I did buy it. And so it's going to be real bittersweet when like a week from now, this thing <laughs> shows up in my door and I go, all right, I got, it. <laughs> I, got I got, I got all the, I've got all the rise of the rune Lord miniatures. Um, I'm good to go. <laughs> I like that, Kieran. I like the don't don't get into it. I mean, we have so many miniatures that we don't even have to do this. But like, you know, like for me with buying the Rise of the Ruler miniatures, I was like, there's some minis like in person that I think would be really awesome, like the Rune Giant or the Scribbler or Karzug or Mokmurian or, you know, any of those other later game uh, and big boss NPCs and stuff like that. And I was like, I want to have look at the, the, the Patreon chat. Uh, or the 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 live stream chat has been throwing the money down. Let's go for it. You know, it reminds me. Actually, you ask yourself, why do you guys have so much miniatures? Why do you have so many miniatures? Why do you have so much Dwarven Forge? We did a campaign. Aaron Smith ran it. We played in my apartment. We were in our early twenties, and we played a campaign where you could pay ten dollars to re-roll a d20 you could pay like 30 dollars or 50 dollars to get a bonus feat this was third edition D D. okay we had one player who literally turned their barbarian and bought like 10 extra feats for their barbarian and they spent like 500 dollars or due to do it or 300 dollars to do it or something crazy or ridiculous and you could pay like 50 dollars or 100 dollars for like a custom broken magical item and we did this and the game was ridiculous and it was actually kind of awesome but it was also really ridiculous now why did we do this it was a fundraiser and we raised like $1,200, and then we went to a store and said, hey, you want to cut us a deal? We want to buy, like, eight cases of D&D miniatures from you, and would you cut us a deal? And they said, yeah. And so we literally bought hundreds and hundreds of boxes of D&D miniatures uh, that fill the shelves of, of Aaron's basement and of our, of our, of our collective gaming collections that we have been using for 20 plus years now. And we have more miniatures than most people can dream of. And it's cause you know, we funded it with some, uh, some pay to win, you know? Um, 
and uh, Wheel of Pain paying for hero points, kind of the same, kind of the same thing, you know? Um, but, you know, it was it was fun and crazy and stupid. Would we do that again? No. But was it awesome that we, as a group, spent all this money and we people got to have these ridiculous characters that you could never, ever legally have? But we also had this big binder that was just stuffed full of $20 bills. Um, and, you know, because everybody was just out of college and everybody had their, like, their first real, you know, big job and making real good money. So, you know, everyone's still single and everyone, you know, was still unmarried, and no kids. So everybody had all this extra income and it was like, yeah, fuck it. Well, I'll pay $100 for this. I want I want my magical item to be able to let me turn into a phoenix. And it's like, yeah, you do. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. 100 bucks Done. Um, and now we have more miniatures than we can count. And we have, and like, if you go on to like troll and toad, like some of these miniatures, especially the ones from like, that were like huge, like the three by three miniatures from like giants of legends and some of those sets, some of those individually sell for a hundred dollars a piece. And we have some, and some of those we have like six or seven or eight of. So we're very spoiled. We're very blessed. Um, but the moral of the story is, you know, if you want to make money, you know, you have to sell out and you have to make sure that you have no integrity because if you do that, you will be incredibly successful. Um, if you stick to your guns and you play safe by the rules, you're going to be poor and make no money forever. So moral of the story. Yeah. All right. On that fun note, I've got, uh, I was supposed to play Pathfinder tomorrow, but Tim is sick and Bob is going to his, Oh, no, he's going on a date with his wife. I think Saturday he's going to his, like, third cousin, once removed, in-laws, child's first birthday. Um, but, uh, so I'm not getting to play tomorrow, and I'm disappointed because my cleric of Saren Ray is fifth level, and that means he gets to take Fireball as a prepared spell. And I was really looking forward to casting fireball ironically i don't think i'm going to take any actual third level cleric spells i think i'm just going to take a fireball spell maybe two but a fireball spell and probably like a heightened calm emotions because man that spell is sweet we literally just like i cast it on a group of ogres there was four of them i hit three of the four ogres with the blast or the burst and two of them uh one of them critically failed two of them failed and then the third one, which wasn't affected at all, they we just, you know, surrounded and just destroyed him instantaneously. And, uh, you know, Aaron was just like, all right, if you guys want, we'll just say that this encounter is over. And we're like, yes, that was awesome. And that was incredible. That was a lot of fun. So I don't get to play tomorrow, which is unfortunate. And I don't get to play Tuesday because I killed my party. Damn. So no Pathfinder 2 for me for a while because then... I'm going to Vegas and I won't be back till the next, next Friday. So I'm going to be like no Pathfinder 2 for like two weeks. That is a very, very long, you know, Ann Ryder. It's, she's cool. The Dawnflower. I do it for her, her, her belief in redemption and her belief that everyone, everyone deserves a second chance. Um, Yeah, but also Fireball. <laughs> Ah, David, that is that is the question that will that will that question will echo for eternity. Um, is did the party kill themselves or did the wheel of pain kill the party? Would the party have died without the wheel of pain? I think so. If the party had gone back to town instead of proceeding forward, then it wouldn't have mattered how many spins were on the wheel of pain because they wouldn't have been in the combat. So it's a it's it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I personally believe that at the time that the party, the people who had donated money that resulted in Tim's death, I thought that they had got, had their fill and that the Tim was dead and uh, the chat would sort of balance out and we might see some more hero points. When the group decided to go in, I was like, okay, this is kind of risky, but I like what they're doing here. They're doing this stealth based approach. Um, and then they said, okay, well, we're not going to do the stealth based approach. It's the two characters, the two ogres from Fort Rannick that, kicked our ass last time. Let's sneak in and ambush them. And I said, oh, oh, I think you're all dead now. So there was kind of like a series of moments where I was like, they could turn around and go back to town and they'll be fine. Okay, they're going to go in, but they're going to just try to do something sabotage. They're going to try to be sneaky. I was like, okay, this is very risky, but I still like what they're doing. And then when they said, we're going to ambush, and I was like, oh man, this is not going to end well <laughs> at all. 
Um, <laughs> the wheel of paying. I like that. It was the wheel of paying. Um, I, 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 if I have one annoyance, if I have a one annoyance with everybody, um, and this would be my annoyance with, um, I mean, this is my annoyance with, with anybody who complained. Um, this is my annoyance, uh, with, uh, you know, with Matt, uh, and his, uh, you know, his take on the wheel of pain is nobody complained about getting 10 hero points, you know, nobody after the first session, when the, each of the heroes had eight hero points, none of the PCs were like, Derek, I think this is too stupid. I think this is stupid. I think this is broken. This is dumb. Um, like it, it's one of those, like, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, uh, it, 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 you, it went the other way. Um, they were both stupid, you know? Um, and people that are upset are only upset because it resulted in the character's death. Um, when it, when it was, when it, when it resulted in basically auto wins, uh, no one cared, you know? So yeah, hero point, feel good. We'll feel bad. Fair enough. But in terms of like a game balance perspective, they're all just ridiculously broken. Um, and Anthony that yes, Correct. And it was, and it was, it was very thick. I am not going to tell you that I thought that the higher end wheel of pain spins were equivalent to a single hero point, but also realize that, um, as an example, if you donated, um, let's say, uh, you donated $120 to me. Okay. That would, re that would generate something like, uh, or let's say you donate a hundred dollars to me that would generate like three wheel of pain spins. Whereas a hundred dollars donated to the characters would give them two hero points each. So that's eight hero points versus three wheel of pain spins. Some of the wheel of pain spins are essentially just mosquito bites. So there is a very real chance that when you, because when you start focusing on one person, the cost doubles each time. So, the heroes had the advantage that you could spread that out. Um, and so like, that's what happened that first session. That's why all the heroes had an insane number of hero points. Um, now, so Pierre, you are hundred percent correct, right? T that was Tim's first session. Okay. But Pierre is mentioning is that the first session that Tim played Gwildor, he's a seventh level caster. He had phantasmal killer. He showed up. There was a, they were fighting four skin cell cultists and Tim hit him with a phantasmal killer. And he said, I said, uh, he fails. And then Tim says, I'm going to down. He's like, Derek, your hero points. Let me downgrade us. I go. Yeah. He goes, I'm going to downgrade that to a critical failure. And I go, okay, Tim. Well, what happens then? And he goes, make a fort save. I said, all right, what's your DC? He goes like 23 or 24. I go fail. And he goes, he's dead. And here's the thing. That was awesome. I loved it. Uh, people, uh, people loved it. It was awesome. Um, so yeah, um, I think the Wheel of Pain was bad. I think Derek Hero Points, before we even started tipping for them, were becoming a problem. I think after we allowed people to tip for them, they became an even bigger problem. Um, and um, we will be substantially getting rid of that or rolling that way, 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 way back. Also... Yeah, it was the most balanced, unbalanced thing ever. That is a good way to describe it. It was the most balanced, unbalanced thing too. Um, our favorite games are balanced, unbalanced games. Also very true. Uh, yes, Ben says this. It was totally awesome. I loved it too, but it was totally broken. It was totally awesome. It was awesome, amazing. I loved it, and it was totally broken. I hate, hate, hate incap in PF2. I have like a whole video where I bitch about in incapacitation. Um, yes. Uh, hero points in particular were very, very powerful for a character like Bob, who is all in on this one attack. He even built his character, right, with like the Mauler free archetype with a power attack because it, it was worth it for him to just make this one ultimate mega attack because if he misses, he can make it a hit. And if he hits, he can make it a critical hit. And it's just absolutely powerful, you know? Um, You know, and I. I'm not going to dis, I cannot, I can't tell a crystal ball, but I've been jamming for a very, very long time. It is my fundamental belief that I think a TPK was going to happen in this adventure if there were no hero points and there were no wheel of pain spins, because I don't think the group was up for the challenge of these encounters. And I don't know what the right situation is. Some of it was, um, the characters were built kind of, I mean, I, maybe it's a Pathfinder two thing, but like 
and I don't have enough experience yet playing like martial characters at higher levels, but I can tell you that like any flying creatures, like all the spell, like Barl Breakbones was going to fly. Like Lucretia had access to a fly spell, uh, a greater invis spell. The way that Azius had a greater invis spell cast on him, it's like, what would the party have done if someone had a greater invis spell on them? I don't think they would have done anything. And, and, and you know, a character like Bob and a character like Escanor, uh, Azius and a character like Escanor, they literally did not have an ability to have an arranged attack. Um, to me, that just seemed like a fundamental flaw. Like these characters were built very badly. They they had very poor saves. Um, they did not have access to you know things that were going to let them fly and let them things that were going to let them detect invisible creatures. They just you know it's like at low level you can get away with that because the creatures don't fly and the creatures don't turn invisible. But like uh, you know when they start doing that and they all start doing it, I just think it becomes really really problematic and. Uh, that combined with the fact that the resources were so low, I, I just felt like it was probably an inevitability. But, you know, we'll never know because the Wheel of Pain buried them uh, into into oblivion. Yeah, one bad thing about APs is that unoptimized characters get railed on later. And I think that's true of Pathfinder 2, period. I don't think you have to be playing an AP to not do that. Um, I agree, totally agree that Rise of the Rune Lords and Path 2 is to fairly unforgiven. Lucretia or Barl or the dragon from the next chapter will be rough for this party. Yep, yep. Uh, Lucretia and Barl, by the way, because they never fought Lucretia at Fort Atlantic, Lucretia and Barl would have been in that final fight, which Lu Barl was a level 13 character, 120 XP. Lucretia was a level 10 character because they were supposed to fight her as sort of a boss at Fort Rannick. So in Fort Rannick, they were level 8, and she would have been a level 10 creature. And that would have been a tough fight, but she fled because they never killed her because they fled because they got destroyed. So Lucretia went and joined Barl in his throne room, which is what the adventure suggests you should do. And also it makes a certain amount of sense because she would be retreating back to their base of strength. And then you're talking about a 13 level 13 stone giant necromancer warrior who is level 13 with 120 experience points and a level 10 Lamia matriarch occult spontaneous caster who is worth 40 XP. Those two together is 160 XP. Um, and, uh, I, I, I think that would have killed them. So even if they were at full power, full power, I think it, I think they had l less than a 50% chance to beat that fight, especially since they had so few resilient runes in the party. So their saves, those are two pretty powerful spellcasters. Um, you know, Barl would have opened up with a vampiric, uh, vampiric exsanguination cone and just like probably crit one or two characters. And like, I think it was like they would have gotten crit for like 16 D six times two or something opening salvo. And it would have been a nightmare. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Age of Ashes. Age of Ashes has the problem that the fights are, too over tuned right there's a lot of severe fights and you know the math of pathfinder 2 once it gets starts getting going the wrong way like it's hard for you to get back there there isn't a lot of wiggle room and then and you don't have the ability like you had in earlier editions to sort of you know we make fun of it i call it, i call it the uh break in case of emergency glass it's supposed to be break in case of emergency colon glass but you don't have access to these resources like when we used to play in pathfinder one or third edition you know we would have these sort of get out of jail free cards these sort of like you know vial of last hope these sort of like uh you know black arrow i've saved you for last i've always recovered you i've never used you you always had these sort of like dead man switch options that were like that could get you out of a really really sticky situation i don't know that pathfinder 2 has those and so when things go south, when the, um, you know, the dice rolls go against the party, you don't have the ability to come back from that easily. And so that's why I think it can get, it can get, it's like a snowball. It can cut, it can just get going really quick, you know? Um, <laughs> Frank, my group, my group also TPK at that stronghold eight years ago. Oh, well, you know, good company then, Frank. Cheers to you, buddy. Cheers to you. Um, yeah, PF2E spirals very, very hard. I agree. Um, and, 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 it, and like, once you start, like once a character goes down, now you're in this, like you're running around trying to heal them, which means you're not putting damage onto the boss or you're not putting a fear under the boss. Or you're not putting a demoralize under the boss. You're not putting a flank under the boss. And now suddenly no one can hit because the rogue is down and like very quickly you just fall apart and there's nothing that you can like 
reach into your bag of tricks and sort of like ding, pull out this like this one time use activation that's really going to save the day. Like even your magical items, which are usable once a day, are pretty lackluster if we're being honest with ourselves. You're like, oh, I'm going to activate my bracers of dashing. It takes an action. I have plus 10 feet to my speed for a minute. Like that's not, it's not, it's not getting your butt out of the frying pan, you know, like you, you need things that can like help you survive these really, really tough encounters or when even a not tough encounter goes sideways, you know? Uh, Jason, I have not played Reflections and I've never even heard of that game. So I do not know where to put it in my RPG hierarchy. I'm not sure. Yeah, but Gabriel, but he, like, let's take let's let's take a look at something like uh, let's take a look at uh, Potion of Expeditions Treat and and then Ruin Smith. I want to say what, comment on what you're saying, and then I'll probably wrap it up for the night. Um, to drink a potion of Expeditions Retreat, okay, I would have to. Uh, let's say I had two swords. Okay, well, I don't want to like drop my sword on the ground, right, <laughs> and like run away from it. So I have to spend one action to sheath my sword. Then I spend my second action to pull out the potion of Expeditious Retreat. And then I spend my third action to drink the potion of Expeditious Retreat. And guess what? I didn't even move that round. I would have actually been able to cover more distance if I had just moved and not drank the potion of Expeditious Retreat. So by drinking the potion of Expeditious Retreat, I actually moved nowhere. So... And in a fight that lasts maybe two, three, four rounds tops, it's like you just don't have time to do that. And the effect that you gain from it is just not good enough. Now, Ruinsmith, some consumables do get out of jail. So in the Pathfinder 2 game that we are currently playing in, that I'm a player in, because of the way it is it is different than most Pathfinder 2 games, but one of the things that we have been gaining access to is higher level consumable spells. We were level 4 and my character got access to a level four, aka character level seven, spell level four, scroll of dinosaur form. They're a cleric, but they have free archetype druid, so they have access to primal spells. I cast dinosaur form, the seventh, you know, the fourth level druid primal spell, dinosaur form, when I was only fourth level. So I cast that spell three levels earlier. It was awesome. When you cast that at level seven, you're like, oh, okay, I'm kind of a worse fighter i'm kind of a worse barbarian like it makes me okay but it doesn't really actually make me any good i turned into a freaking dinosaur a freaking t-rex and it was awesome my attack bonus was great i had a like you know it's like oh it gives you like 15 temp and you're like yeah at level seven you're like that's like a quarter of a hit but at level four my hit points were like 30 so 15 temp was like a 50 percent increase in my hit points it was awesome and i felt like such a badass for using this high level consumable item um and i was like man that was pretty sweet but i think rules is written uh, and using the, the standard progression of loot that the game would suggest, and certainly that you would ever experience in an AP, uh, published AP, you would never actually get access to that or really have a good way to be able to afford it. So that was really fun, but, you know, I wonder what would have happened if they surrendered. Well, characters never surrender and they never flee. So, uh, so we'll never know. Had they surrendered? I don't know. Barl seemed to respect them. Maybe the hags wanted to convert them into undead forms like they did Lamatar Biden, captain of the uh, captain of the Black Arrows. One thing I am disappointed about, Ben, is no one got to see my awesome complex hazard that I built for the fight with Lamatar Biden, um, the now undead ranger form of the uh, of the formerly of the captain of the Black Arrows, who was, of course, uh, killed and captured and converted into an undead warrior uh, to serve Barl and the hags. And I made this awesome ha complex hazard, uh, which I'm also positive would have completely wrecked the party. Um, but we'll never get to see it because they all died. But we, we don't know. They didn't surrender. Uh, yeah, incapacitation is a good thing and also a bad thing, and I, it's a complicated issue, and uh, we're probably not going to get into it right now. Um, would I keep the Wheel of Destiny around? If I keep anything around, Anthony, it would be the Wheel of Destiny. Um, that is cool, Zan, but at that point, you are, you know, you are changing the rules of the game, and you are playing it differently. 
um, gamer me, you're better off dropping that sword and using that action to pick it up at the end of the turn so you at least have a sword in hand, at least. Yeah, it's crazy and it's stupid, and but that's the kind of crazy, weird things that we get to, right? And that's what's crazy about that. Yep, I agree, uh, Pierre. That's an exact painful moment. Um... Oh, I have heard of this game, Jason. I have heard of this game. I don't know anything about it, but I have heard about it. Uh, dinosaur form at level seven, just to be on par with any archer other than the fighter. Correct, Gabriel. Yeah, I, 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 sh I don't. Fighter doesn't even really exist in that category. He's so above, right? Uh, yeah, the dinosaur did wreck the shit out of the greater bar guest, and it was pretty awesome. Um, right. Also, yeah, that's an, uh, actually we got two seventh level, uh, two fourth level spells. We took greater dinosaur form, and we took uh, improved visibility. Or uh, we took improved visibility, which we cast on the rogue, and then the rogue has the ability to cast invisibility. He cast it on me, and so I started the fight as a dinosaur, invisible. But they didn't know what was going on. And the greater Vargas was like, "What is that?" And then I, you know, decloaked as I ripped into him from behind. It was awesome. Um. Yes, that is also true. Um, <laughs> self, self, self confessed cynic. Damn it, L5R is winning thanks to this stream. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Finn. I was talking it up too much. Come on. You don't want to see some samurai drama? You're from the Eastern Hemisphere, right? That's. It's much. That's a much more. You know. You should be more. You should be more in touch with that. I'm from the west. You are from the east. Um. Yeah, we love the bar guest. You see what you did, Ben? <laughs> you lost out on a complex answer. I. Uh, you know what? I will share it. I will share it for the patrons. I will. I will actually share the. Uh, I mean, eventually. Uh, my goal is to. You know, uh, I've been promising this for a long time, but like. Uh, promise uh, to get my uh, of rise of the rumors conversion notes out to everybody that i did for the first three adventures and uh definitely still intend to do that um but I, I will i'll share maybe some of these uh things in advance so people can really kind of contemplate what that really would have looked like um i thought it was pretty cool i thought it was a pretty cool complex hazard um in particular in combination with lamitar biden um i believe if i correct if i recall correctly uh, Lamitar Biden was a level 11 monster, so he was 60 XP, and the complex hazard might have been a level 10 or 11 complex hazard, so it was either 40 or 60 XP, making that either a 100 or a 120 XP fight, so it was either severe or, like, severe minus, but, um, the problem is, is, like, the group had no ability to deal with, you know, no one had thievery, um, they might not even have had a high enough proficiency level to even be able to attempt the check. So, um, it was awesome, Gabriel. It was awesome. I got to be an invisible dinosaur and have it be awesome. Instead of being like, oh, I turn into a dinosaur. And then like the GM's like, yeah. And it's totally balanced. Like your attack roll is like exactly the point where you're only going to hit on a 12 or higher. And you're like, cool. Cool. Instead, I, I got to turn into a T-Rex and I got to wreck face. And I felt like it was like that scene from Jurassic Park where the T-Rex comes out and he's like tearing at the flipped over car. But imagine if the flipped over car was this like super high level boss and you were killing it instead. And it was really awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and it is true. It's hard to afford the higher level items, the consumables, uh, the most likely in APs. And, you know, it's hard for them to even have access to buy the higher level ones. And then if you do have the money, if you're spending them on all the consumables, then you're not buying your, you know, potency runes and your striking runes and your resiliency runes. And then you're behind and then your stats suck and blah, 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 blah. It's just horrible. Um, love it. Ah, uh, Damien saying L5R should win. He's like probably so excited here. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys for the super chats. Uh, there was a necklace of fireballs as well that we got a higher level necklace of fireballs. What an amazing item. It's so cheap. Everyone should be rocking necklaces of fireballs. So many of them. Great item. Great item. Especially if you can get it a level or two early because then, you know, by the time you could actually get the item, you're like, oh, all the monsters pass this save on a five. But if you can get the item a couple of levels early, you're like, oh, this is actually a really fun, cool item. The monsters don't auto pass this. The monsters aren't going to be, you know, the boss isn't going to be critting on a six plus or a five plus and taking no damage. Instead, it's like a good chance that they're actually going to take some damage. It's a really fun item. 
especially the smaller versions of the fireball where you have like these 4d6 or 3d6 fireballs but the dc is still you know reasonably high so it's like it's not so much damage that it's like a nuclear bomb but you know the necklace usually does have that one high level one so it's like you do have that fun get out of jail free card nuclear bomb option but you also can still get some smaller aoe's so that like a martial character who otherwise can't really do much against aoe's has a fun option so i really like the necklace of fireballs very impressed with that item and the price is very competitive on point um yeah, OSC is great. I love OSC. I mean, it's just a, a remake of, of BXD&D, and I love BXD&D. It's cleaned up, and I really like the formatting, so I approve that. I am going to kickstart this new advanced a a OSC, which I just haven't done yet, but I need to, but it, I am going to kickstart it. Um, just switch from L5R to Monster Heart. Bring down the chaos. All right. Well, maybe we'll do both. You know, we, we can do both. Por que no los dos, as they say. Uh, now we're uh, Australian Samurai. Good day, mate. Care for a duel. Um, I Pierre, come on. We, we're trying to close. We're trying to close the session out, Pierre. We don't have time for this. We'll we'll get it next time, buddy. Uh, how would I do this? I did this once in fourth edition. It backfired horribly, but I did create a a boss that was like an amalgamation of five different bosses, and uh, it was uh probably not worth the time and effort that I tried to put into it. Is what I would say because no matter how much time and effort you spend putting into a thing, the players are going to either. Kill it, or it's going to kill them really quickly anyways, and you're going to feel disappointed and let down. Monster hearts. Um, uh, let's see. All right. <laughs> Pierre says that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to shout you down, Pierre. I'm just saying, like, it's 1030. It's 10, oh, it's almost 11. Sheesh. Um, Uh, you are correct. We're talking about when we made when we made when we made the multi action uh, skill challenge monster type. It was a boss monster in a uh, fourth edition D and D. And uh, our friend Ross uh, won basically killed it in one go. So, hey, GM Scott, you just caught up and the stream's ending. Well, uh, we'll go to eleven. All right, we'll make it. We'll make it an even eleven. So, but I appreciate the tip, GM Scott. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind words that you sent me uh, after the TPK. Uh, appreciate your support, especially coming from a gentleman and a scholar like you uh, means a lot to me. Um, I understand that not everything that we do here on this channel is going to be for everybody. Um, I understand that even within the RPG space, I have a very uh, unique, sometimes cynical view. Um, and that's just really born out of a deep and abiding love that no one else can ever possibly understand. And uh, to to hate a thing, you must love it. And uh, I love these games so much, and I hate them too. Uh, <laughs> you can always tell a DM. Uh, you can always tell a DM by their ability to talk for four hours without a break. Yeah, well, you know. You know, David, the whole reason this thing even started, and like even with the podcast, do you understand? I mean, I, I cannot stress this enough. Every Friday, I go over to William Brandis's house. Okay, and for many years. And recently we've been playing Pathfinder 2. He's the GM, I'm a player. The game will end around, you know, uh, 1130, 1145, 12 o'clock, depending on when some of the guys have to go home. Okay, we've been, I've been there since 630 or, you know, 645. We play D&D Pathfinder for five hours. It is very, Aaron has th three kids, okay, and a wife active in his church, owns a business, very busy man. Okay, weekends are his time off. We routinely, I don't get out of there till 4.30 in the morning, okay? We will spend the next five hours just talking about RPGs after we just spent five hours playing RPGs. Um, and uh, and we just do this every week. And then, by the way, I'll go, I got to go. It's 4 a.m. He goes, yeah, I'll see you in eight or nine hours when we meet up to record our podcast where we are going to talk about RPGs for three to four hours. Um, and uh, it's just what I do. It's what I do. I love it. Um, I've loved it since I was first introduced to it. It um, is an amalgamation of all my hobbies. I love reading and I love stories. I love board games. I love card games. I love dice games. And um, and I also love puzzles. And I think those, you know, and, and, and maybe there's even a certain element of me that enjoys um, of, of acting and uh and like i said storytelling and um i think the, the combination of enjoying those four oh and i like and i like war games i like i like fantasy i like you know warhammer and um 
uh, games like that, and I've always enjoyed that. So, and I like swords, I like swords, and spells and magic, and it's like the perfect hobby, and I love it. Uh, yeah, we'll finish up with that. How was I introduced to RPGs? Well, like everything in my life, um, most of the things in my life have came from my uncle. Uh, rest in peace. He died when I was in my early twenties, but um, my dad's youngest brother uh, was uh, named. Uh, interesting side note: my initials uh, are D A M, Derek Adam Melinda D M. But every male in my family. And my sister, we all have the same initials. So everyone in my family is DM, okay? My dad, David Melinda, specifically David Allen Melinda. My uncle was Darren Anthony Melinda. We had Andrew, Daryl, or Daryl Andrew Melinda. We had Dennis Anthony Melinda or something. D-A-M, my sister was Deidre Ann Melinda. So everybody is D-A-M. So everybody in my family has the initials DM. Um, And... Uh, the uh, my uncle was my dad's youngest brother. Um, he he had uh, cancer when he was a young child, and this was back in like you know like the seventies or whatever, you know the late sixties. And he read a lot, and he got introduced to fantasy, and he got introduced to Tolkien, and he grew up. And when I was like ten, I had my my dad's oldest brother's oldest cousin Mark was like ten years older than me, and then my dad's youngest brother. Uh, was like 10 years older than him. So it was like me at age 10, my cousin Mark at age 20, and then my my uncle at age 30. And my uncle and my older cousin Mark had been palling around for years because they were so close in age because, it, again, it's my the youngest brother and then the oldest son of the oldest brother, right? So they were pretty close in age. They were only like eight years apart or something like that. Um, and they had really gotten into, in the 80s, you know, video games and Dungeons and Dragons. And when I turned like 10 years old, I had read The Hobbit and I was really getting into fantasy role playing games uh, or like uh, Hero Quest and those kind of board games. And they basically basically they showed up one day and they said, you're old enough to be interesting now. Uh, it's time for you to, to come learn how to play a real game. And I literally got to go to their they, they lived out in uh, eastern Ohio in Rock Creek in Ashtabula County, a little bit of a drive. And I got taken out there to like their game. And it was like the classic you know, early nineties D and D game. It was like, you know, cans of Mountain Dew and bags of chips and uh, like eight or nine or 10 people all playing first edition AD and D. And they told me to roll up a character and I was level one and someone else was playing like a level 27 character or something like that. And it was all crazy and it was nonsense. And um, I loved it. And I did that every weekend for like a whole summer. Um, and we would go out there and like spend the weekend there and we'd like camp in a tent in the backyard. And it was it was, it was awesome, and uh, but, okay, here's what happened. The late 90s, uh, early 90s happened, and then, like, computer games started to get real good, right? Like, you started to get, like, the first, um, you know, like, the Diablo 1, or, like, you know, the first, like, 3D RPG games, and my uncle and my cousin were just, like, in love with these video games, and like I had grown up playing video games and I was like, oh, these are nothing special. But for them, they were like, oh, these are so great. And they, you know, this is back when everybody had like hand build their own PC and they, you know, kind of stopped playing D&D &D because they started playing, uh, gosh, I'm even trying to think of some of the games like, you know, Heroes of Might and Magic and Diablo 1 and Warcraft 1. And, you know, I thought, oh man, I can't believe it. This is, you know, this is over. And then my cousin Mark left, he went to seminary school and he comes by one day and he goes, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to, I'm going to become a priest. And he hands me this duffel bag and it's full of all of his first edition D and D books. And he basically just says like, you earned it, use it well. And I went, Oh man, this is amazing. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know who I'm going to play this with. And uh, I was in seventh grade and uh, I went to the bus stop for my seventh grade year and I met two friends, um, one of whom Justin and the other one is Mr. William Brandis, Aaron Smith. And I heard them talking on the bus stop about playing D&D. &D, and I said, oh, D&D, &D, uh, I know that game. I've been, I've been playing it for the last year or so or, and I'm really excited. And, and they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I have all the books. And they were basically like, oh, OK, well, you could be the DM then. And I went, OK. And that's literally how it started. And uh, that's how it uh that's how it started, and that's how it basically has continued to be on from here on out. Uh, and, you know, we played like that through middle school and junior high into high school and into college. And 
you know, some people have come and gone and some people have, have stayed. And uh, we've had pretty much a solid, pretty much group since like, you know, our, our 20s. And now we're going into our 40s and we're still going strong. So um, that is uh, that is it. So that is how I got introduced to RPGs. And I hope uh, I hope I can introduce some of you to some some new RPGs. I hope I can share with you some uh, future stories that we can kind of share and experience together. Uh, Tuesday was was definitely a seminal moment. It was uh, it, it was exciting. It was disappointing. It was profitable. It was frustrating. And I think everybody who feels one of those four things, uh, you're right. It was all of those things. Um, and and uh, you know, but something isn't you know something isn't special because it lasts. You know, uh, and uh, I think um, there are a lot of ways that that campaign could have ended, including us being like, "Hey, we're not. We're just we're finishing it. We're not pr producing it anymore because it makes us no money and it takes too much time. And peace. We'll never. You know, you'll never see the end of it. So that's one way it could have ended. In fact, that is honestly the way I thought it was going to end. So for it to end differently and in what I would say spectacular fashion it's hard for me not to be uh you know pretty happy about that so I think I think that's it I think that's where we're gonna leave it so um I uh I look forward to talking to you all I'm sure we'll be here back here next week for something on Tuesday maybe with the group maybe with the guys maybe just me uh next Thursday I'm gonna be on vacation so I will not be available um, but, um, but definitely take a look for our schedule. We'll, we'll have something on the uh, calendar for next week before I head out. And other than that, I think, uh, I think I'm going to say good night to you all. And we'll see you next time on the nights of last call. <laughs>